All right, I'm here, so let's actually start. I'm gonna just adjust the mic. Welcome, everyone. So, as you can see, as you can hear, um, I'm sick. My voice is not amazing. But I think we'll be able to do something today. It shouldn't be a problem. So, um, today I'm going to show you how to make a game with Godot 3.5. We are going to make a simple Asteroids clone. Um, this will show you how to use Godot, how to make player movement, instance, new scenes, um, work with enemies, etc, etc. I think this can be really interesting. I will try to keep the live stream below two hours. I think maybe maybe we will need less than that. I will try to make it as concise as possible, but also as understandable as possible because this is aimed at beginners and of course if you're watching this uh, as a replay on youtube well you can enjoy and go wherever you need to find the information you need in the video i will try i'm not saying that i will do it but i will try to add the chapters after doing the live streams um i will try to add the chapters that way you can uh, go to the different places that you need so hopefully you will find this interesting and i'm sorry i'm just moving that really quickly hi gory san how you doing so yeah um so if you don't know me really quickly just in case i'm mr elliptic uh i have a youtube channel where i talk about game dev and this is my second channel mr Ellipteach, teach where i teach about Godot and I teach about game dev basically so if you're interesting interested you can go on my main channel to see content around game dev which is not um, only about Godot but I will put that in the chat hey decor how you doing okay so yeah we will be doing we will be doing the the tutorial right now. So this is this is kind of a test for me. I want to make a I want to make some sort of a free course on YouTube, and I thought okay maybe it could be interesting to try it first as a live stream um, to see what are the questions, um, what the viewers want to see. What are the pain points, the things that they don't understand? That way, when I make the free course, which is going to be probably an hour, an hour of video, that way I can really focus on what is important for the viewer. So yeah, um, I think we can start. Obviously, this is more aimed at people watching the video again later on. Not really... I don't expect you to be doing the tutorial right now, but if you want, you can. And of course, if you have questions, you can. Without further ado, I think it's time. Um, did I post? Yes, I posted. Okay. Let's go. Okay. So first things first, Godot. Godot is a free and open source game engine. You can go on godotengine.org to download the latest version so on the main page you have download you click on there and there you have multiple choices but really what you want is the standard version so this is the version that is going to use gdscript the scripting language of godot uh, this is a different version to see to support c sharp but usually as a beginner you don't really want that and then you can choose on 64 bit or 32 most people will use 64 bit unless you have a very old computer in which case you would like to use the 30 bit 32 bit so you can click uh, on 64 bit it will download and there's nothing else to do you can simply click on the executable and that's it you can use Godot. the download is around 60 megs i think so Godot is very lightweight and it should run on most computers which is a good point especially if you have like uh, a poor, uh, not very performant laptop or something like that. Hey, Couscous. Hey, Refills. How you doing? 
Welcome to the stream. So I'm not going to download it again simply because I have it on my computer. But as I said, it's just an executable. You can place it anywhere. You can, you can keep it in the downloads. And that's it. Okay. Uh, not good of 4 today. No, not good of 4. Simply because good of 4 is still in beta. But um, if, if I see interest in this kind of live stream, or if people like the, the at least the replay, um, I can totally redo that with God of War. Maybe just later to make sure that it's a bit more stable because right now it's it's crashing sometimes when you're doing particular stuff. So for today, God of 3.5. But really, the difference is going to be small. If you understand how God of works with God of 3.5, you you can use God of 4. It's not that different, um, and you have resources online. To understand uh, the differences so once you have that you open up godot you double click on it and you arrive on this page so as you can see i have quite a lot of projects because well godot is is my work so you won't have a lot a lot of projects like me uh, but this is fine so this is the godot project manager this is where you see all of your projects and most importantly where you can create um a new project so The first thing that we can do is click new project and here what I will do is um, write a project name so asteroids let's call it asteroids right I'm gonna choose a project path with browse so dev game dev I'm gonna put it somewhere around here please choose an empty folder because right now the, pro the, the folder was not created so I'm gonna click create folder and right now I have a new folder where I want, which is called Asteroids. The first thing that you can see is that you have two choices, open GLES 3.0 and 2.0. So you can ha you can actually read those two descriptions. Uh, this is the higher visual uh, fidelity one. This is basically the renderer. And in most cases, I think you can go with 3.0 without any problem. In the very special case where you know you're going to target, for example, an old device like um, an old Android phone or maybe a browser that is not supporting the latest features, you can go with OpenGL ES 2.0. There are a few differences inside of Godot when you use that, but most most of the things that we're going to do should work fine on both. So I'm going to, I'm going to use the 3.0 just to have all of the features, of course. And then I can click create and edit would you please add an online high score system in the end well honestly i think it's going to be out of the scope of this tutorial um but if you're interested i can show you really quickly how i would do it and what service i would use i made a video about that actually i made a video about that on on this channel you can check it out if you want about different online leaderboards services that you can use and there's one that is made for Godot so I think this is probably your your safest bet if you're interested in that but the thing is for this tutorial I think it's going to be a bit um, longer a bit too long uh, OpenGL 2 will load the game far more faster in HTML5 also okay interesting to know yeah I guess I guess the the the, the fact that they are way less features is easier for html5 the the thing that i don't like about um gles2 is the particles the the main difference personally for me is that the particles cannot use the gpu they run on the cpu so they are pretty pretty slow <coughs> My voice is already degrading. <laughs> I hope I'm going to be able to do the, the whole live stream. Okay, so let's continue that. Once you open up the project, you are faced with this uh, interface. And I'm going to run you through the interface really quickly. But we are going to go through every step of the interface as we need it. For example, when we create a new scene or when we want to interact with the world etc so don't worry about that so on the top on the top left here you have your scene tab 
This is where you're going to sh to see all of your nodes in the current scene. Right now, we don't have any nodes, so Godot is telling us that maybe we want to create something, but we're going to go back to that really quickly. On the bottom left, you have the file system, so this is interesting because this is basically your project, and everything that you're going to put inside of your project is going to be shown here. Um, right now, we don't have anything. We have the icon.png, which is the default icon, and we have a default environment, um, .traes. This is a resource in Godot. Um, we are going to go back to that later on. I will show you what it is. In the middle here, we have the viewport. This is probably where you're going to spend most of your time, because um, this is the way to see the 2D world, the 3D world, and the scripts. So as you can see, right now we are in the 3D world, so I can, if I click on the mouse wheel, I can move around, I can do a bunch of things, but this is not where we are going to go, because we are working with 2D today, so if we click on 2D, we are going to, to see the 2D canvas, and we are going to come back to that, of course, in just a second. And the third thing that can be interesting for us is the script tab. So if we click on script, right now we have nothing, but later on we'll have the script editor. So Godot has a built-in script editor, so that way you don't need to use, for example, Visual Studio Code or whatever. You can do everything inside Godot, which is super useful, especially if you're a beginner. Um, just for you to know, there's also a fourth tab here, which is the asset lib. If you click on it, you can actually browse some add-ons and plugins made for Godot. So for example, I, I don't know, let's take this one, health bar 2D. It's probably going to help you to do a health, a health bar in 2D. Um, easy charts is to help you to do charts in Godot. If you want to check it out, you can uh, check it out. It's it's out of the scope for today, but this is an interesting resource where you can find lots of cool stuff to help you go faster. And <clears throat> if you're interested in add-ons, I made multiple videos about it on my channel, explaining you what they are and also showing you some cool add-ons. Okay, to finish this um, walk walkthrough, on the right-hand side, we have the inspector. And right now the inspector is not showing anything because basically this will show all the informations relative to a node. So when we are going to create a node in just a second, we'll have a bunch of information here. And, and then we'll have also more information about the node itself in the node tab. Um, the last thing I want to show you here, I think, is the navigation bar at the top right. So you have this little arrow here, which is basically used to launch the project. And then you have different icons that can be used to launch different part of the project. So for example, this can <clears throat> launch only one scene. All right. So the first thing that I want to do is go into the project set settings and make a few changes. So if I go on project, project settings, don't be don't be scared there are lots of things what we want to do is go under display window and the first thing i want to do is change the size of the window so i want to go with 1920 by 1080 this is the base resolution of your project so see it as oops i clicked away see it as the resolution on which you will work this is the resolution you intend your game to work on but of course you can then upscale the window or downscale it to fit whatever size is needed. I'm gonna keep it as resizable for now. This means that it will appear as a window that I can move around and resize however I want. Um, of course, you can change to go in full screen if you want, but don't do that if you don't provide a way to exit your game because it's a bit frustrating for the user otherwise. So then you have, um, at the very bottom, you have stretch mode. This is important because this is used to make sure that the window and the game will resize with your window. If you don't do anything, by default, your game is going to be 1920 by 1080. And if you resize the window, nothing is going to happen, which is not amazing. So you have two, um, two modes here, 2D and viewport. We can go into the details 
of what they are in just a second. Um, and then we have the aspect. So this is how do we want the window to be resized? How do we want the content of the window to be resized? In my case, I'm going to say, okay, I want you to keep the aspect ratio. So 1920 by 1080 is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And I want you to keep it. It means the, the window cannot get larger or taller. It will stay at the same aspect ratio and it will just resize like that. Um, I wanted to show you the stretch mode really quickly. Okay, so one aspect that is really important in Godot. Hey, Pumpkin. Pumpkin, actually. Hey. Um, you can go on, on the documentation of Godot. The, the, the documentation is available um, also inside of the engine. I will show you that later. But <clears throat> really, the, the documentation is the way to go when you have a question. Because most of the questions that you will have, especially as a beginner will be inside of the documentation. And so if you look at the stretch mode, it's clearly explained here what are the stretch modes and what you want to use. So for example, stretch mode 2D and stretch mode viewport are explained here. And so you see that, for example, if you want to do a pixel art game, you should use a viewport otherwise you should use 2d it doesn't really matter for your first project um, but in the in in the future when you have more questions about how things work and how godot should be operated you can go onto the documentation and usually you find lots of interesting things you can also find um, tutorials so this is a very good thing to do go see the documentation so let's keep the stretch mode to 2D and for now we can close this as we don't need to do anything else. Um, actually we need to do something else. So let's go back really quickly and we can go into the input map. So this is just the tab next to general and if we go in there under input map we see a bunch of actions with a bunch of keys. So the input map in Godot is a very neat way to map an action to a key. So for example, let's say in, in the game that we are going to create, we are going to be able to move around the scene. So rotate, go forward and backward maybe, and also shoot. So <clears throat> the input map can be used to define what keys should produce those actions. So for example, if we, if we do if we write left and we click enter, we can see that we have a new action that is called left. We can do the same thing for right, the same thing for thrust, let's say, and finally shoot. You can also click on add if you want. It's the same thing as pressing enter. So now you have those four actions, but they have no keys attached. So basically you cannot trigger them. So we are going to add a key to every action. So for example, for left, I will click on the plus here. And you have the choice. You can use mouse button, joy axis, joy button, etc. In my case, what I want to do is use the physical key. So the difference between the physical key and the key is the physical key is Godot is going to try to understand what physical key you're using and not only what key you're pressing. So let me show you an example. So if I select that and I press Z, you will see that it's actually printing W because I'm using an Azerty keyboard. And so where my Z key is on a QWERTY keyboard, it's actually W. So why is it important? Well, by, do, by using the physical key, I make sure that I'm actually interested in where the key is on the keyboard and not what the key actually is. The big advantage with that is you don't need to care about if the user is using an Azerty keyboard or a QWERTY keyboard. You don't care about all of that. You just care about where is the key on the keyboard. So you can use physical key for that. So I'm going to use, I'm going to say OK. Um, but I will change that because, of course, I don't want 
W to be left. So to edit an action, I can just click on the little edit icon here. And then I can use, for example, in my case, that would be Q, which is A in physical. Okay, so now let's do it for the other one. So right, I will use D. Thrust. I think I will use D. I think I will use Z. So that would be W. And shoot, I think I will use the space bar, right? Okay. So with that, basically, I have W, A, and D to move around and space to shoot. If you want, and I think this is a good practice to do, you can also add the arrow keys. The good thing about adding the arrow keys is that you make sure most people can use your game, especially, for example, people that are um, not very used to use, using WASD, for example, left-handed people. So you can click on, the, on here, physical key, and I will do the same thing again. So I will press the left, left arrow key. I will do the same thing for right. The same thing for thrust. And okay. So as you can see, you can add as many keys as you want for an action. That way you can prepare in advance multiple layouts that will all trigger the same actions. I will do one last thing because I used I, I love to play games with um, a gamepad. So I have an Xbox gamepad here and I'm going to also use that to control our spaceship. So for left, I will click on the plus here. And this time, instead of physical key, I will use joy axis. So I will I will use one of the axis of the gamepad. For example, the left joystick. So I click joy axis. Device is the device zero. It's the first one that is connected. And then I choose the axis. So I want axis zero, left stick, left. Okay, this is to go left, add, then I can do <clears throat> the same thing again, joy axis, Less, left stick right, perfect. Then I can go and do the same thing for the thrust. So for the thrust, I think it's fine to use a trigger, so I think I will use R2, but you can also use a button, for example, if you want. I will map those two. So let's say thrust is... Actually, actually, maybe no. Maybe you don't want that to be the to be the thrust because you want it to be shooting. Yeah, okay. So let's go with joy button. For the thrust, let's use DualShock Cross Xbox A Nintendo B. Yeah, so we're going to use A, the A button on the Xbox. And finally, for the shoot, we are going to use the joy button and we're going to use the button R2. So R2 is a bit special. It can be used both as an analog input and as a button. If you're using it as an analog input, it will give you um, something between 0 and 1, a value between 0 and 1. Otherwise, it will give you true or false, basically. Okay, so with that, we have the actions that we need to make our character move. So let's close that. Let me drink something because my voice is really tired. And then we'll go back to creating the, the player. <coughs> All right. <clears throat> so now what we can do is we are back to where we were at the beginning. And basically, Godot is telling us that we can create something from here. So I'm going to choose 2D scene. And right now, I have a new 2D scene that is created with a node 2D as a root node. So the first thing I'm going to do is save. So Control S to save. And I have this dialog box where I will create a new folder by right-clicking, new folder. I will create a folder called Scenes. I'm now in this folder, and in this folder, I will create another one that I will call player. And inside here, I will rename the scene to player.tscn and hit save. So now you can see that I have my player here, 
And if I go under the file system, if I go under scenes, player, I have player.tscn. Hey, Suji man, welcome. So, right now, the only node that we have, the only root node that we have is this node 2D. In Godot, a node is basically a an object that has a bunch of properties. So this is a node 2D, it has a bunch of properties, but most of the time we want to use something else because a node 2D, basically the, the only properties that it had, that it has, and you can see them on the right, for example, in the inspector, you can see that it has a position, a rotation, a scale, also some things related to visibility, to how it should look, but you cannot do much with that node. So the first thing that we are going to do is right click on it and change type. In here, you can in this dialog box, you can see everything that Godot can do in terms of nodes. And what we want is to search for kinematic bodies. So I'm going to show you really quickly the other bodies that you can use and what they are. So under collision object, physics bodies, you have three objects kinematic body, rigid body, and static body. I will not go into details, but I can explain you really quickly what they are. Basically, a static body is a physics object that you want to put in your world that will not move. So for example, you can imagine this as a wall, maybe the floor, or a tree that is not going to move. So this is an object that will react to physics, but you shouldn't move it. So now, if you want an object that will react to physics, but that will also move, you can use a rigid body. So for example, a rigid body, you can imagine a ball, um, maybe a bullet. So things like this. Things where you want them to be able to use the physics, but they will move. And finally, the kinematic body is in a way, it's a bit like the rigid body, in, in the sense that it will use physics, and that it will move, but you will have to make it move. You will do the code to make it move, whereas the rigid body will move by itself. Like, you will define a few properties, maybe gravity, um, the weight, etc., and then it will move on its own. You will not touch it. So kinematic body is a special type of body where you have to program the movement and this is what we are going to use so double click on it and now you can see that our root node the icon changed because it's now a kinematic body so let's double click on so let's click on double click on on here and let's change the name to player just for us to understand what the node is because we we can then use this in other scenes i will show you First thing that you can see is that you have a configuration warning here. If you read the message, it's telling you that the sh the the um, it's telling you that the kinematic body that you're using has no shape. So basically, it cannot collide with any other object in your world. And I told you it was going to use physics. So we need to define a shape. So to do that, simply click on it, add child node, and we are going to search for collision shape. Here we can use a polygon or a shape. The difference is just that a polygon, you can draw the polygon very precisely, however you want. And collision shape, it's just a bunch of shapes that are predefined. So I'm going to use that. All right. So again, we have a um, configuration warning because we, are, we have created a collision shape. But if you look on the right in the inspector, under shape, we have nothing at the moment, so we need to actually put a shape. So if you click on it, you have a bunch of options. I'm not entirely sure right now how it's going to look. It depends on the sprites that I'm going to use, but I think we can use a capsule shape. So let's let's click on capsule shape. And right now you can see in the 2D inspector that you have your capsule shape. <laughs> Yeah, kinematic body, you control the physics. Rigid body, the engine controls the physics. Exactly, yeah. 
So really quickly, I didn't tell you how you can move around in the to the environment. So with the mouse wheel, you can zoom in and zoom out. Um, also, if you if you click on the mouse wheel button and you drag, you can basically pan around the 2D world. Um, and I think that's and if that's really what you need. Of, of course, if you click on an object, you can see that it's it becomes highlighted here. It means that you're selecting this object and that you're going to move it. So I can move the collision shape away from the player, which is not really something that you want to do in this case. So if you made a mistake, if you made a mistake like that, don't worry, you can hit Ctrl Z to go back or you can go under the transform here and you can see that under position, you have a little icon that appeared. And basically this icon is telling you that you made a change um, from the default value. So if I click on it, it's going to go back to the default value, which is that the position is zero, zero. Okay, but we'll come back to that. So I have this shape. Um, one thing that I will do is I will go, so I click on collision shape and under inspector, under transform, I will go under rotation degrees and I will input 90 degrees. <laughs> So basically what I'm doing is I'm rotating the collision shape because in Godot, the rotation, how can I explain that? We're going to use that later on, but basically in, in Godot, uh, facing to the right is the default rotation, if you want, right? So I know that in this case, it's not, it, it looks like it's not the case because we input 90, but because this is... Uh, for Godot, the capsule shape is upward, is is facing up. But in reality, for example, if you're if you're using a a sprite, and we are going to do that in just a second, you're going to see that default orientation is zero degree, and you want it to be facing to the right, because then if you use an angle, for example, if you want to point ninety degrees upward, it will it will go from the right. But we'll come back to that in just a second. Okay, so now we have a player and a collision shape. This is super cool, but we need something else. We need a way to see the player. This is where we are going to use a sprite. So, if you're watching this right now, and if you're watching this as a replay, you can see that in the description of the video, you have um, a link. You have a link to a Google Drive with all of the assets that we are going to use today. <coughs> If I ever create assets today, I will make sure to upload them on the Google Drive. And of course, you will find the source code at the end of the video. I will upload that to GitHub. So you will find the assets. You can download them as a, as a zip file. And really quickly, I can show you how they look. This is the assets that I've created. We have some sound effects and we have some sprites. So one simple thing that you can do right away in, under the file system, you can right click on wherever you want, for example, on player, and you can click on open, open in file manager. This is going to bring a new window. So I'm using Windows, but if you're using Mac or Linux, it's going to be pretty much the same thing. And you can see that it's exactly the same, um, the same file system as we have under Godot. So scenes, player, and here I have players.tscn. So what I'm going to do is create a new folder right here, the folder, I'm going to call it visuals, and under visuals, I will place my sprite. So I can take my player sprite and make sure to copy it. Okay. So we can go back to Godot, and as you can see, the folder that we just created, and also the sprite that we just created in Godot, um, in the file system, sorry, is now seen in Godot. One thing that we can do, if you click on player.png, you can go on the top left under import, so this is another tab, and in here you have a bunch of options that you can use to change how Godot is going to import your um, image. So in this case, we don't need to change anything because the default options are fine for us. But maybe later on, we would need to go here. For example, if we want, if we want the sprite to repeat, 
we can go in here and tell Godot that it should repeat. So if you need to change things, for example, the scale or whatever, it can be inside here. But right now we don't need that. Okay, so now we are going to create the sprite. We have, in Godot, we have a bunch of ways of cre creating a new node. You can go on the player node and go add child node. We did that earlier for the collision shape. But you can also drag and drop things. And Godot will then try its best to understand um, what the type should be. So for example, if I take player.png and I drop and I drop it um, somewhere on my scene, you can see that Godot has created a sprite node. This is a sprite node named player with the texture that we want. Um, if you do that, be careful though, because the position, for example, here is a bit different. It's not 0, 0, because I drag and dropped somewhere on the, on the viewport. So just for the sake of completeness, I will show you another way to do it. So if you want to remove a node, you can simply click on it and hit delete node or use the, the, the delete key on your, on your keyboard. So delete, okay. So let's go on player. Either you click, right click and add child node or you do control A to go faster. And here you can type sprite and we're going to use a sprite. So right now we have the sprite but there's no texture. Again, multiple ways of putting the texture. You can either take the player.png and drag it to the texture. As you can see, Godot is um, highlighting the, 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 the field to make sure that you can put it here. So you can do that. Or you can go under texture, create a new stream texture, and then use the texture. But this is not the, the, the preferred way. Or you can go quick load. So quick load is a new option in Godot 3.5, I think. And quick load is basically showing you all of the resources that you have under your project that can be used in this field. So in this case, it's showing me player.png, but it's also showing me icon.png because this is an image that I can use. So I'm going to use player.png, double click on it. And right now I have my player. So um, I didn't show you that earlier, but if you de-zoom, the, uh, the rectangle that you can see here, the, pur the purple rectangle, is basically the camera, right? This is what you will see in the game by default. This is what the camera of the game will see. So as you can see, my player is quite big, okay? Compared to the camera, compared, compared to the whole game, it's quite big. So we can change the scale of the sprite. We have a few ways of doing it. You can either directly do it inside of the viewport. So if you take one of the handle here, as you can see, it's going to scale. Um, it's going to scale the, the sprite. Of course, if you made a mistake, control Z. The only problem with that is, as you can see, it's not respecting um, the aspect ratio. And also it's not, it's not doing it from the center. So if you want to do both of those things, you can hold maj and alt at the same time so shift and alt at the same time i think and then you can scale from the center using the right um aspect ratio okay and then you can choose all right <coughs> of course if you want to be more precise you can go under the scale option here and you can choose whatever scale you want for example 0 0.25 0 0.25 okay so now the player is going to be that big compared to the to the game maybe it's fine i think the best way is to test so we are going to do a few things and then we are going to test as fa uh, as quickly as possible so the collision shape as you can see the collision shape is not visible right now it's behind the sprite so in godot the order of the nodes in the tree is also the order in which you will see the things. So right now, the last object is the sprite. So it will be drawn on top of everything. That's why you don't see the collision shape anymore. So of course, you can toggle the visibility if you want to see better temporarily, for example. 
another way is to take the collision shape and drag it below the sprite. And now the last object is the collision shape, so it's actually appearing on top, okay? If you want to change that, you can also use the Z index property in the inspector. But I would advise to first try to make sure that you organize your tree correctly and then maybe move on to using Z index if you have no other choice. So what I want right now is a, I want to adjust the collision shape of my player because as you can see, all of these parts here are not going to be under the collision shapes and I don't think it's very good. So actually a capsule shape might not be the best thing I'm thinking now. Or maybe I can put it upward. Let's do that. So we can under the rotation degree, we can click on the little icon here. Then the capsule is upward again. And with the handle like that, we can adjust the size of the capsule. So it's actually going to, I'm using a capsule, but it's actually going to look like a circle. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. Um, you, this, is, this is also a choice of game design. If you want, usually you don't want a very a realistic collision shape, simply because a realistic collision shape maybe will not be fun for the player. And the most important thing when making a game is that it feels good, right? So for example, imagine that I trace the collision shape to take every detail into account. I could get stuck right here. I could get stuck on an object, which is not super interesting. So let's keep the, let's keep the collision shape like that. If you want, you can go here. Um, under the little arrow icon and choose another collision shape. Try it yourself, use a bunch of collision shapes and maybe you will find something that you find more interesting. It doesn't really matter for now. Uh, what matters is that you have a collision shape. Okay, so now that we have a player, I think it's time to actually make it move. This is going to be exciting and we are going to create a script for that. So on Godot, in Godot, you can actually click on any node here and you can add a script. So the script will be attached to a node. In this case, because I want to control the whole player, I'm going to attach the script to the root node of the player. So right click, attach script. You can see a bunch of information. Let's go through them really quickly. The language is GDScript. That's what we want. It's going to inherit Kinematic Body 2D. So if you're not really familiar with uh, OOP, I think you should learn more about it. But basically, inheriting Kinematic Body 2D means that you're going to inherit all of the functions and properties that a Kinematic Body 2D has. So in this case, it's very useful because Godot, uh, the, the team behind Godot, coded a lot of stuff for us with the Kinematic Body 2D. So you will see that we're going to use later on a bunch of functions that can help us to make our player move and collide with other stuff. So this is important. Class name, we don't care about that. Template, no template for now. Built-in script, not really important. It's whether you want to have an actual file for the script outside of your scene. We want that, so that's okay. And the path, the path is actually quite important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the little directory icon here. It's going to open up the dialog. And we are under player right now. So I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to create a new folder called scripts. I like to do that. You're not forced to do that. Um, in the case where you have multiple scripts inside your player scene, for example, if you have a bunch of objects that are inside, it can be useful. Um, it's just a way of organizing things. So if you want to organize things differently, it's totally fine. And once you're ready, you click create. Okay, so now what you can see is basically we switch from the 2D, 2D viewport to the script viewport. So if you want to go back to the 2D viewport, you just click on 2D here and then you can see your object. And if you want to go on the script, you can either click on the script icon here or click on the script icon under on, on the tab or 
click on the script icon up there. So really you have a bunch of options. All right, so let's go back to script. And now we have a bunch of things. So the first line is what we asked Godot to do. This is basically inheriting all of the um, all of the things that a kinematic body can do. Um, we'll come back to that in just a second. Here you have a bunch of comments. So in good, in GDScript, a comment is using a hashtag like that, and you can see that it's showing you how to declare variables. We are going to do that also. And then we have the function ready and also the function process that is right now a comment. Um, the function ready is actually super useful. It's a function that is called at the very beginning when your node is actually put inside of the tree and is ready to be used. So this function, you use it a lot. For example, if you want <coughs> to set up the color of something, set up the speed of something, when you want when you are first entering the game maybe you want to do something and you can do inside this function so the first thing that i'm going to do is remove all of the comments for now because i don't need them and at the very top i'm going to define a few variables so i'm going to define variable speed and i'm going to use the uh, semi comma no uh, colon I think it's colon in English I'm gonna use colon and I'm gonna say which type it is so in Godot you don't have to type your variables if you're if you're familiar with programming you know that some languages are typed and some are not Godot is dynamically typed so you can um, you can for example do var speed float and say 30 but you can also do var um, I don't know, shooting speed 30. And as you can see, it's also working, even though I didn't tell Godot which type it was. Because Godot is going to internally understand or figure out what should be the type for this variable. It's going to assign a type internally. Um, but I would recommend, as a as a beginner, I would recommend you to take the time to type correctly your variables. It's going to help you a lot, and also it's going to help you with writing the code. Because Godot, when you write the code, Godot is going to be able to provide more information, um, provide some autocomplete for you based on the type of your variable. Alright, so let's move on. So, at the moment, we don't want to do anything inside the ready function. Maybe later on we want to do something. What I want right now is for me to move. I want a way to move. And what I can do is I can do that in a function that, it, that will be called um, in a loop. So, in Godot, you have two functions that are called in a loop. You have process and you have physics process. It's really nice for export variables too. Yes, Thomas, we are going to go back to that in just a second um, because I'm going, in, I'm going to turn the variable into export variables. So what are the differences between process and physics process? So both of those functions are called in a loop. So it means that when you launch your game, those functions are going to be called over and over again. The only difference is that process is going to be called as often as possible. So if you have a really, really beefy computer, it will maybe will it maybe this will be called like a thousand times per second. Whereas the physics process is going to be called at the same speed always. And actually the speed by default it's is 60 FPS. But if you go if you go into project project settings under general and under physics physics common you can see the physics fps here and you can actually change that for example if you go with 90 then the physics process function is going to be called 90 times per second so what 
which one should you use basically? Uh, maybe you think that you should use the process function because it's the one that is running most often. In this case, it shouldn't really matter, to be honest, but usually when you do something that is related to physics, you want to do it inside the physics process. So in this case, we are going to move the player, and remember, the player is going to use the physics of Godot, so we want to move the player inside of the physics process. Just to be sure, because everything is synchronized, right? Uh, good, well, that's why that's why the physics process is called at a certain rate. It's because Godot is is going to do all of the physics calculation. So if you do if you do some of the calculation somewhere else, it can it can be a problem in terms of synchronization. So usually, when you move something with with physics, you do it inside the physics process. Um, but for example, if we want to check the input of the player. So let's say that you want to go left or right. We can do that as often as possible. That way we can react as fast as possible. Honestly, in this case, it doesn't really matter because 60 times per second is honestly enough. But anyway, so let's actually do that, right? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check if the player is going left or right. So I can do var. I can do direction. So I'm... I'm I'm, to me, it's, it, it means direction, but I'm just inputting deer. And in here, what I can do is I can tell Godot that it's a float. And remember, if we go back in the project settings really quickly, under the input map, we created left and right, right? This is to know if we want to go to the left or to the right. You could, you could, if you want, for example, do um, input dot is action just pressed or input dot is action pressed to know if the action is being pressed or not. But then this is, this is returning a Boolean. So you would have to do if is in, if input is action pressed, etc. What I, what I want to do is I want to use is no, I want to use input dot get action strength. I will use right. So this function is a bit different because it will um, it will tell me how much the button is pressed. So on a keyboard, it doesn't change anything because on a keyboard, a button can be zero or one, right? Zero, it's not pressed and one, it's fully pressed. But remember, I want to support gamepad too. So with this function, I will be able to know how far I'm using the joystick. So get action strength is really interesting in that sense, is it's giving us a value between zero and one. And if you want to know more about it, you can go under the documentation. And remember earlier, I told you that one way is to go on the website, but another way is to go inside of the documentation of Godot inside Godot. So you can go control, you can hit control and then click on get action strength and it's going to open up the documentation. And so here you can read what the function is doing. So in this case, it's telling you that it's returning a value between zero and one, representing the intensity of the given action. In a joypad, for example, the further away the axis is from the dead zone, the closer the value will be to one. So you can understand that this is really useful to get an analog value. All right, let's go back to the script. So with that, I'm getting a value from zero to one. But what I want is also to take into consideration when I go to the left. So I can go minus input dot get action strength left. OK, let's pause for a second and let's understand what it's doing. So. This will give us something between 0 and 1 if we go to the right, right? And this will give us bet something between 0 and 1 if we go to the left. But there's a minus here. And this is why it's important. Because if you put your joystick to the right, you will have this that will be 1 and this will be 0. So basically your direction will be equal to 1. But if you go to the left, this part will be zero and the second part will be one. But because we have a minus, 
we will have minus one. So why this is important? Well, because if you go onto the 2D viewport, you can see both axes. So the, the, the green axis is the Y axis and the red axis is the X axis. And in Godot, you can actually take the player, go under transform, and you can see that if you input, for example, a hundred, you go to the right. So positive X is on the right. And if you go minus a hundred, you go on the left. So in Godot, the positive side is on the right and the negative side is on the left. And for the Y axis, it's the opposite, simply because of how the computer screens are drawn. It's not really important for now. But if you go 100 in Y, you're going down. And if you go minus 100, you're going up. Okay, so now let's go back to the script. And now you understand that basically with just this one line, we have either a 1 when we want to go to the right or a minus 1 when we want to go to the left. So this is really useful. And we will and we can do that also for different axes. For example, if you're doing a top-down shooter, maybe you want to go up and down, you can basically do the same thing to go up and down. Okay, so with direction, now we know if we want to rotate or not. We will use that to rotate, okay? So let's actually do that. In here, I will rotate the whole body. So I will do rotation. Rotation is a property of our base node, right? It's actually the same property as you can see here. It's just that here the, the rotation is in degrees and in here the rotation is in radians. Um, we are often using radians when we're doing math computation, but you can go from one to another using rad to deg. There are two functions in Godot, rad to deg, to go from radians to degrees, or degrees to radians, if you need. So what I want to do is I want to rotate based on this direction, okay? So rotation, I need a value though to know how much I want to rotate. So let's go up here and let's create a new variable. Let's go and create var rotation speed. So this is going to be a float. And actually, I don't know what should be this value. Um, but one thing that I can show you is that we can use the function right here. So we can use deg to rad. That way we can input a value in degrees and it will convert it to radians because we are used to radians and we are not very used to uh, we are used to degrees, sorry, and we are not very used to radians. So let's say I want to rotate at a rate of, I don't know, 15 degrees, maybe. Then I can use this rotation speed in here. I can say, okay, every frame, this is a frame, every time this function is called, I want to rotate at a rotation speed in the direction that I'm choosing, all right? And one very important last thing, I want to multiply by delta. Okay, so what is delta? Let's do a quick pause here. Delta, you can see that it's passed by Godot in this function. So delta is telling you how much time has elapsed since the last frame, right? Remember that this function is called as fast as possible. So basically every time the game is, pro is producing a new frame, something that you can see. It's calling this function, but this can, this can, var this can vary, right? It can change from um, time to time. Let's say you're in a very demanding scene. Maybe your computer will struggle and will reduce the amount of frame that it can generate. So if you want a consistent result, you want to use Delta. Ba Delta is the time that has elapsed since the last frame. And this helps you make sure that the calculations that you are doing are not dependent on the, on the amount of frames. Um, if you want another example to understand that, 
imagine imagine that you have a variable that is called um that is called count right imagine that you have a variable that is called count i will put it here otherwise it doesn't make sense and what you do is every frame you add one to the count if you're not multiplying by delta and your computer is really fast let's say it's running at a thousand frames per second in one second this will be at 1000 right it will count very very fast but let's say i have another computer which is far less powerful and it's running at only 30 fps in one second it will count to only 30 fps now imagine that you're doing important calculation in your game and in this case for example we are making our player rotate if you're not doing the same depending on the computer that you're running the game on if the rotation is different it's going to be weird right so that's why you multiply by delta because delta is this very small amount of time that was between the previous frame and the last frame so if we take back if we go back to our analogy um, if we are running at a thousand fps it means that delta it means that delta is equal to one divided by a thousand so this is a very small number right and if we are running at 60 fps or 30 fps even worse it means that delta is 1 over 30. so even though we are running much faster here we are multiplying our 1 with a delta that is much 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 smaller so it means in the end it mean what what does it mean it means that every time we are calling the frames we are adding the same amount because we are multiplying by the by the frame time basically so if the if the computer goes really fast we multiply that with a very small number something like that so the value that we add is smaller and if the and if the computer goes slower the value that we add is a bit bigger of course and in the end we have the same result so i think this is cool um delta is very important and that's why you can see it here passed in both of those functions because you want to take it to, into account every time you're doing something every frame you want to take delta into account if it's not super clear don't worry it's okay you will see delta in every games that you're going to make so it's going to start it's going to make sense at some point so let's go back to what we were doing every frame we want to rotate our character depending on the direction so if we don't press any button this will be zero so we will not rotate and we want to rotate at the rate of rotation speed times delta okay i think it sounds good so let's actually test that to launch the game we can launch the the scene uh, with this button here we can launch the current scene so click on that and it's going to run our game so let me put it here so you don't really see anything simply because um the camera as you can see this is exactly what we should be seeing by default the camera will be placed here okay and so our player is in the corner of the camera it's only later on when we will put the player somewhere that we will have the uh, that we will be able to see him correctly don't worry so let's go back to that and you can see that if i press left or right my player is actually moving it's actually rotating pretty cool okay so let's continue that but before that really quickly i want to go into under project settings under general under uh, window and under test width and test height i want to change that to something smaller so this is just to tell godot okay when you launch the game <coughs> launch it with a different resolution than the base resolution 
So I'm using a smaller resolution, that way I can easily move the, the, the window somewhere where I want, okay? All right. So let's continue with what we were doing. As you can see, the rotation speed is quite slow. And I don't think it's really... It's, it's not super practical to have to go to the code every time I want to make some change on the values. So one very cool thing I can do with Godot is make these values available right on the editor, okay? And to do that, I can simply do export before the variable. So just, just before the variable, you can type export. And now, as you can see, under the inspector, you can see your two variables, the speed and the rotation speed. So the rotation speed right now, of course, it's the rotation speed that um, that has been calculated by Godot. So maybe this is not super practical because, as we said, doing things in radiance is quite hard. So actually, let's do that. Let's say that we are doing everything in degrees. And so here we want to go from degrees to radiance. Okay. That way, this is for the user. This is for the developer, if you want. So you use degrees. And then in the code, we transform that to radiance. And that way, as you can see right now in the script variables, we can use a value that is much more closer to what we can understand. So let's go with something much bigger, maybe 40. And for the speed, I can already tell you that uh, 30 is going to be way too, too small. So let's go maybe with 400, but we can change that. Um, so one very important thing with export variables is this is, you can see that as the default value that you set in the code, okay? But if you change the value in the editor, Godot is going to use that value, okay? So the value that you see here is not the value that is going to be used. It's only the value that is changed in the editor that's that is going to be used so this is important because i know that a lot of beginners can make the mistake with export variables they can be like oh why is my player not going fast enough because they think that they are changing the code here but in reality this is overriding everything okay so now we have we have the rotation so i think we can go and do the movement now So to do the movement, we are going to go under the physics process because I want to move um, only in the physics process. You could also do the rotation only in the physics process. Honestly, you could do you could do both. You could do both. It doesn't really matter in this case. Uh, let's create a new variable and let's call it thrust. Okay. So thrust is a float, and by default it's zero. I also need a new variable to be able to move, and this is going to be velocity. We are going to use the velocity to move, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. So let's let's create var velocity. It's going to be a vector two, and by default, it's going to be at zero. So now in the physics process, actually let's go actually let's go in the process and let's go in the under input. Let's call input get action. Uh, we can do get action strength, but in reality, I don't think we have analog. I don't think we put an analog thing on the thrust, right? The thrust is either zero or yes, we put A on the thrust. Do you think it makes sense? Maybe we can we can reverse those. Because right now I'm using the thrust to... I'm using A to thrust. So I'm not using the the analog thing. I think maybe it could be better if we change that. So under settings input map, we can remove the button here. And we can use joy axis this time. And we will use the axis R2. Okay, so this will give us 
a value between 0 and 1 with the analog trigger. And under shoot, un we don't want to use R2. So let's remove that. Let's add a new one. Joy button. And this time we can use A. If you want other buttons to shoot, for example, maybe you want to use... Um, maybe you want to use... R1. You can also add R1. Here, really do what you want to make you... Um, comfortable. So in here, what we can do is use the same technique as we used before. So input, get, action, strength, and we can use thrust this time. Let's, let's put that into the variable thrust. And now we'll have a thrust value between 0 and 1. So as you can see, I've defined the thrust variable outside of the function. I've defined it um, at the beginning here. That way, thrust is available both in the process and in the physics process. This is super useful because I need to be able to access this, vi this variable in physics process and also in process. Whereas um, the deer, the direction here, is only available inside the process function. <coughs> so, in here... What I want to do is use move and collide. And as you can see, move and collide, the function is asking for a, um, a vector. And the vector that we want to pass is basically the velocity. So we are going to define the velocity in just a second. What we need to do is also multiply this velocity by delta. We need to do that because move and collide is not... <laughs> Move and Collide is not um, doing it for us. There's other functions in Godot that are already doing the multiplication by delta, but Move and Collide is not doing it. So we need to do that. Okay, so basically with that, with that function, Move and Collide, which is provided by the fact that it's a kinematic body 2D, our body will be able to move. This is super cool. But... Right now, you can see that the velocity is not set, so we need to set the velocity somewhere. So actually, under the process, what we can do is say velocity is going to be thrust, okay? So thrust is how much we want to move multiplied by something. So it's going to be multiplied by the speed, of course, because this is what we define here. So speed is how fast do we want to move, and then we need to know in which direction we want to move. So in this case, we can use um, we can use the direction of our node. Okay. So we can say that we all always want to go where the where the player is facing. Right. We we want to go in which direction the player is facing. So how can we do that? Well, in Godot. We can use the global transform dot x. So this can be a bit involved. Right now you don't you don't need to go in, in in much details about what it means. But basically, at the moment you can see that the player is aligned with the x-axis. It's basically facing the positive x-axis. But when you when you're going to rotate the player, it's not going to face this axis anymore. But the global transform.x is telling us in which direction the x-axis of the player is, okay? So when the player is going to rotate, let's go back to 2D. When the player is going to rotate, you can imagine that there is an x-axis for the player that is pointing like this, okay? It's basically rotating with the player and we can use that to know in which direction we want to go. So we can use global transform.x. And with that, if we launch again. We should be able to move.
Thrust. Did I make a mistake here? I need to launch that. Uh, what did I put in thrust? Thrust. Oh yes, I put W, of course, and I was pressing space. So let's launch again the scene. And now if I press W, as you can see, the character, the player, is moving in the direction where it's facing. So if I rotate, then it's going to move in the direction where it's facing again. So that way, you can move like this. Okay, so of course it doesn't look super good, but we are going to fix that in just a second, okay? It's just that we need something to get started with. Okay, so if, if you arrive there, congrats, because you have something that is moving on the screen. Of course it's not amazing, but it's a start. And uh, as you can see, the values are still way too small. Like, the speed is kind of okay, but the rotation speed is terrible. So let's go with something much faster. Let's go with 100 in the rotation speed. And the speed, I think we can maybe make that a bit, a bit um, higher with 500. Okay. So just to get, just to recap what we did here really quickly, because this is going to be super important. Uh, we are going to use the same logic for all of the things that we are going to use later on. So this is a quick recap. We created a new scene, which is called player, okay? The root node of the scene is a kinematic body, so it's a body that we can... Um, on which we will define how it should be moved. Then we added, as a child of that physics body, we added a sprite, which is showing an image, and we also added a collision shape to be able to move it around and collide with other objects. Then we added a script on the root node. And this script is basically going to tell Godot what should we do with this object. So the first thing is that it's extending kinematic body 2D. Which means that we will inherit a bunch of methods and variables that were created for the kinematic body 2D. For example, the ability to move and to collide with other things. Then we define variables. So these are the variables that we defined. Speed, rotation speed, thrust and velocity. Most importantly, two of these variables are export variables. It means that we can access them from the editor. So if I click on player, I can see those two variables and I can change them easily from here. I don't have to go through the code all of the time. Then we talked about the different function that are available. We talked about the ready function, which is called when the node is ready. So when you launch the game, the node is placed into the game. And then when the node is ready to be used, this function is called automatically. In this case, we are not doing anything. Then we talked about the process and the physics process function, which basically are functions that are called on a loop. They are called, in the case of process, it's called as often as possible. So if your computer is going really fast, it's called multiple times per second, like maybe 60 times or a 100 times per second. And physics process is also called on a loop, but at a fixed rate. And by default, at 60 FPS. In the process function, what we do here is we check the input of the player. For that, we use the singleton input. I didn't talk about the singleton because I don't want you to get... Um, it's, it's, it's a bit complicated as a beginner, but you will come back to that later on, okay? Just remember the name singleton. Um, it's something that you can use everywhere in your project. Let's see it that way. So you, we use the singleton input to check the input of the player. And depending on the input of the player, we rotate the player or we change the velocity of the player. So basically at which speed the player should move. And then in the physics process, we use the move and collide function to tell Godot, okay, I want to move my player and I want to move my player at this velocity. The velocity 
is telling Godot in which direction and also at which speed the player should go. So I think this is everything that we did thus far. And now we are going to build on that to make the game more interesting. Um, so later on, we will use the result of Move and Collide to check for collision. But right now we don't need that. So because we have a player that is kind of working right now, what I think we should do is create the game scene in which we will put the asteroids, uh, which are the enemies, basically. Okay. So to do that, you can either click on the plus here or click scene, new scene, how you want. So I will click here. And what I want to create is a new 2D scene. Okay. So right away, I double click on it and I call it game. And I hit control S to save. So I don't want to save it under the player folder. So let's go up. Let's create a new folder and let's call it game. So I call it game, but you can see it as the main entry point of your game. So you call it however you want. I call it game, but you can call it main. You can call it um, game manager, however you want. This is the entry point of our game where we will put everything. So we will put the player, we will put the enemies, etc, etc. So this is the game. Right now it's empty, but we will put things inside it in just a moment. Um, one thing that we can do right away is inside this game, we can add our player. So how to do that? Well, remember, earlier I told you we can add a child node. This is when you want to use nodes that are made by Godot, if you want. These are built-in nodes. What we want to do in this case is instance a child scene. So you can see this. The difference is basically when you do this is because you created a scene and you want to make an instance of that scene. So let's click that. And as you can see, we have, we have two choices. We have game which is the scene that we are currently using, so it doesn't make sense, and we have player. So let's double click on that. And now you, what you can see is that the player is now a child of the game scene. You can actually take the player and put it in the middle, for example, if you want. So as you can see, this is, this is why Godot is super interesting, I think, and very powerful. You basically defined an object, which is the player, with a bunch of things like a sprite, a collision shape, etc. And then under your game scene, you're using the player and you're using it as some sort of a black box. You don't need to see everything that is inside this object. You just know that this object is going to react to things. So you can put it wherever you need. And that's it. So we can use our player here. So for example, if we launch this scene, we are going to see the player. Let's do that. So instead of launching the scene using this icon, I'm going to use the run, uh, play the project icon, and you're going to see why. So Godot is telling me that there's no main scene. Godot doesn't know which scene should be played first. So we are going to tell Godot that we want to use the select, uh, we want to use the current scene. So select current. And then it's going to launch the game scene. So as you can see, if I place, if I show you really quickly the game scene, you can see that it's basically the same thing as what you're seeing in the editor. And if you move, you can see that you have your player moving as you're expecting. Pretty cool. Okay. So I think right now what is important is to create the asteroids that we are going to use, right? So let's go and create another scene again. 2D scene. Let's rename it to asteroid. Control S to save. We go up again, new folder. And let's call it asteroid. And we put the asteroid in here. So the asteroid we have multiple ways of creating this asteroid. Um, one way, one way is to make the asteroid another kinematic body. Um, 
the advantage of making the asteroid another kinematic body is that if your player collides with it, um, it will it will actually collide. There will be a collision made by the engine. Um, but of course, you can just you could make that an area, so something that can detect if something is inside it or not. In this case, I think it's fine. We can. Uh, we can make that a kinematic body. I don't see a problem with that. And to do that, we are going to right click, change type, and and type kinematic body. So remember, it's the same thing with the as with the player. We need to provide a collision shape. So actually, we can use the recent collision shape here. And under shape, we can click create a new shape. I'm going to use a circle shape and make that a bit bigger. Okay, so you can go back to the visuals that you remember under Windows. You can go under the Asteroid folder, create new folder and create a new visuals folder. And then you can use from the assets the Asteroid. So you want to copy it. And okay, so now you can go here, um, shift A to add a new node and we add a sprite again. This time under asteroids, visuals, we have the asteroids and we can place it under texture. And now we have our asteroids, which is a bit big, but I think it's fine. You know what? Let's, let's keep that as the biggest asteroid that we can have. So let's, let's go on the collision shape and use the handle to make sure that it's roughly the same size. It doesn't need to match perfectly. Um, it depends on how you want, you want it to collide with things, but you can make it roughly the same size. Okay. So the asteroids, they are going to be super simple because they are going to move in a straight line. So to do that, we can already do that. We can go under Asteroids and we can add, attach a script. So just as before, I click on the directory, click New Folder, Scripts, and then Asteroids.gd. So I can remove all of that and that's okay. I want to define a few functions. So just as before, I want to define a speed. I'm going to define it as um, I'm not going to define it as S export variable for now. Actually, I can. No, I'm not going to do that because the asteroids are going to be spawned automatically. So we don't need to make that an export variable. So let's do, let's do var speed. It's going to be a float again. And let's say that they move at, I don't know, 200. We can check that later on if it's good or not. Um, they're going to have a velocity, of course, just as we did before. So it's a vector2 and vector2.0 we want at the beginning. And most importantly, they're going to have a direction. So the direction is going to be a vector, which is going to tell us in which direction we should go. In, in which straight line we should go. So var direction, it's a vector2. And by default, we can put it at zero. So this time we are going to use the ready function because the idea is that in the game scene, in the game scene, we will spawn an asteroid somewhere outside of the screen and we will then tell it in which direction it should go. Okay. And then the asteroid will move. So, to do that, we are going to change the velocity inside the ready function. It needs to be changed only once at the very beginning. And then it can move in this direction for the rest of its life. So let's do that. Let's do velocity is equal to direction times speed. Okay, we do that once. And now we have a velocity with which we can work. So, as we did before, 
Funk, Physics Process, and then we are going to simply do Move and Collide with the Velocity times Delta, just as we did before. And so with that, if we define a direction, we are going to have a, an asteroid that is going to move. One thing that we can do is go back to the 2D, to the 2D tab, and change the color of the asteroid because right now it's, it's white, it doesn't look super good. So if you click on the sprite, under the inspector, you have visibility. And in here you can change the color. So modulate and self-modulate. The difference in those two is that modulate is going to change the color of the sprite and all of its children. So if the sprite has children, it's also going to change the color. So if you just want to change the color of this sprite, you can use self-modulate. You can choose another color, let's let's say something reddish like that because it's it's something that is dangerous. And now we have an asteroid that is reddish. <clears throat> All right. So now you want to see those asteroids in motion, I think. So how are we going to do that? Well, inside our game, this is where we are going to spawn the objects. And we are going to go to do that through code. Because you don't want to, to add a bunch of asteroids. You want the asteroids to come forever, right? So we are going to need to instance the asteroids and tell them where they should be, and then tell them where they should go. So to instance the asteroids, it's quite easy, I'm going to show you that in just a second, but to, to tell them where they should go, it can be a quite tricky. So in this case, what I like to do personally, um, especially if I don't want something too complex, you can use a bunch of nodes, and you can use those nodes to select a random position, because how, do, how are you going to select a position that is outside of the camera? You're going to compute what is the size of the camera and you're going to say, okay, uh, I want a number that is bigger than this and s smaller than that. No. What we can do is click Add Child. So we can add a node 2D. I rename that Positions or Spawn Positions. Okay. And inside this node, I'm going to place a bunch of position 2D nodes. So you right click, add child, position 2D. The position 2D is basically the same thing as a node 2D. Um, so it's a node that cannot do a bunch, it, it, it doesn't do a bunch of things. It, it's just a node that has a position, a rotation and a scale. And you can use it to move it around. Also, you can see that when I place my mouse um, at the, the at the zero zero at the origin of the screen, right now you can see a bunch of things, and it can be a problem in the future because if I select it right now, it's selecting the the node that is on top. But if I want to select, for example, the spawn position, as you can see, it's always selecting the position 2D. So one thing that we can do is when we click on a node, we can select right here on the toolbar, we can select the lock. And if I select the lock, I cannot move the spawn position anymore. And now I can only select the position 2D. Also the game, which is the root node, the game should not be, pos should not be moved. So we can go on it and put a lock. And as you can see, there is a lock right now. So we know that we cannot move this node by error. So let's take this position 2D. Let's place it, let's place it somewhere like this. And let's hit Ctrl D to duplicate. And as you can see, it's duplicating the node. And we can place it somewhere else. So by default, when it's duplicating the node, it's putting the node at the same location. So I duplicate the node. It's again at the same position and you can place it somewhere else. So I think you understand what I'm doing here. Basically, I'm creating a bunch of spawn position and I will place them outside of the screen. 
and this is where we will be able to spawn the asteroids. So let's do that. Let's repeat those things by doing Ctrl D and moving the objects. It doesn't need to be very precise because they are spawning outside of the screen. And remember, by default, the camera is this thing. It's the, the, the rectangle that you can see here. So Ctrl D and then you move the objects wherever you need. All right. You can do as many as you want. I think it's fine. It's like quite enough. <clears throat> ah, you can you can hear my voice is like degrading over time. I'm really sorry for uh, <laughs> for you, but I I hope you can still understand me. And so now we will be able to use one of those positions at random when we create a new asteroid and this is exactly what we are going to do right now so under the game right click attach a new script we can go under the directory click new folder scripts okay game.gd open and then we click create all right so now what we want to do is we want to spawn a bunch of the asteroids that we created earlier. To do that, we can basically grab the scene into a variable and then use that variable again to create a new instance. So export variable asteroid scene. It's a packed scene. And we can preload. Um, we can preload the scene. So to get the scene path, one thing that you can do with Godot, you can click on the on the scene in the file system, and then you can drag it in your GD script, and it's going to paste the um, the the path of the of the the scene. Another way to do that, if you want. To, instead of writing all of these, all of this, another way to do it is you click, you cl left click on asteroid.tscn and you drag it, but instead of dropping it, you paste, you, you hit control, and then it's going to preload for you. So it's just doing things a bit faster if you need to. Okay, so let's stop for a second here to understand what we're doing. Export variable, the export is not really needed, but I find it useful because then you can see that your scene is here. So let's say that in the future you want to change the scene, you can easily change from here. You can select another scene. I like, I like making it an export variable, that way I can see the other scenes that are dependent on this scene. So we create a var asteroid scene. I define it as um, I define the, the the type of the variable as a packed scene. This is this is a way for Godot to represent what is a scene. Um, you don't need to paste that. You you don't need to to write it here. If you if you don't do it, Godot understands what you're doing. It's just that, as I told you, I'm trying to always type my variables, and because I know the type of this scene i can use it and then i'm using preload okay so this is interesting in godot you have load and preload the difference is simple when you're launching the game for the first time godot is looking at all the preloads that you have in your game and it's loading all of those scenes beforehand that way when you try to use this scene it's going much faster because godot has already loaded the scene right so if you're doing if you're doing preload it's going to it's going to be a bit longer at the beginning of your game because it's going to load all of the scenes but then it's going to go faster. <coughs> so usually you want to use preload but if you can't or if you need to use some things in a more dynamic way you can use load and load is basically going to load the scene when it's going to be called. 
So in this case, we want to use preload. Let's create a new function. Let's create a new function. And let's say that we want the function to be called spawn asteroids. And we are going to pass a number amount, actually amount. We can say that the amount is an int and it's returning void. So this means this means it's returning nothing. Again, in Godot, you don't need to put it by default. If you want, you can you can um, create your function like that. I personally prefer to tell Godot the type of what it's going to be returned. And in this case, the function is going to return nothing. So we have a function that is that we are going to use to spawn asteroids. And we're going to spawn a, an amount. That way, we can reuse this function to spawn how many asteroids we want. So, to spawn asteroids, we are going to use a for loop. So, for i in range amount. That way, we can do the following things how, as many times as we want. So, how do we instance a new scene? In Godot, it's quite simple. You do var instance asteroid scene dot instance. So basically, we are taking the scene that we just created and we create an instance. We put this instance into a variable that I called that I call instance in this case. And then what we can do is we can say, OK. You can add it. We want to add it to the game. So right now in the game, we have game player and all of the spawn positions. So we can the script is attached to the game. So we can say add child instance. Oops, instance. So what this is doing, it's telling Godot, OK, can you add a child? As the game scene, I want to add a child. And this is going to add the instance that we just created. So basically, it's the same thing as if you do that. Add child. Oops, sorry. Add instance asteroid. It's basically going to do that. So create a new asteroid as a child. And it's going to put it here. By default, it's going to put it at 0, 0. Um, but it's going to do it through code. So the problem that we have right now, I can remove this one, delete. The problem that we have right now is that the position is going to be zero, zero, right? As you can see, when you add something by default, it's added at zero, zero at, at the origin. And we want to use the positions of the nodes that we created earlier. So let's remove that. So let's actually use all of those. What I want is to use a variable to grab. I want to grab the reference of this node. So in Godot, if you want to access the nodes that are in the tree, you can use um, so var spawn pause. I can say that it's a node 2D. You can use the dollar sign and then you use the name or the path to the node. So this function here, this call here, basically tells Godot, OK, grab the reference of that node and store it in that variable. That way I can do things with the node. And as you can see, Godot is not happy because I'm trying to access something that is inside the tree. But I'm doing that um, even if the, the scene is not ready. So we can use a keyword called unready and basically this is telling Godot okay you are going to create this variable and execute that only when the whole scene is ready because you cannot access a child if the scene is not ready right Godot is going to put the scene inside of the game and when it's ready it's going to tell you okay now everything is ready you can access all of the objects. So to access the objects, you want to do that only when the node or the scene is inside of the tree. So now I have basically I have access to this thing and I can use this 
his children. So how can I do that? Well, to get a random position, I will I will put a comment here. Get a random position. I can do. I can do spawn position. No. Whoop. I can do spawn position. I can get I can get a child and it's asking me for an index. So I need to have an index that is random inside here. So in Godot, I can use the function rand range and I want an index from 0 to the amount of children that we have. And in Godot, we have another function called spawn position dot get child count. Okay, so basically I'm saying, okay, give me the child and to know which index, I'm using a random function that is going to give me something between 0 and the maximum amount of children. The problem with that is that it's giving us a float. It's giving us a float and we cannot use a float in get child because this is an index, so it's an int. So we can cast this into an int if we want. So we can use int like this. This makes sure that it's transforming the float into an int. Or you can use another way of getting a random value. You can use rend i. So rend i is giving you a random value between 0 and 2 powers 32. And then you can use modulo, spawn pose, get child count. It's basically the same thing. If you want to know more about random values, I made a whole video about that, giving you a bunch of tips to make random values in Godot. Um, this is something that you usually see in programming. This is giving us a random int between 0 and 2 powers 32. And then we use the modulo operator to limit the amount of values. So actually, let's use that instead. It's going to be much clearer. All right. So this is giving us, basically, this is selecting a node in here at random. And then what we can do, we can say, for example, var. So let's say, let's say this is the var selected. Okay. We can do, in, in, we can do that into multiple steps. To make it more um, clear for you, var selected, then var rend random position, and we can say that it's the selected global position. We take the global position of what we just selected, right? We selected the random node, and then we use the, gl the, the its global position. And so then. When we add the child, after we add the child, we can say instance dot global position is equal to the random position that we just calculated. The order in which we do it is important, right? As you can see, I'm changing the global position of the instance after I'm adding it to the tree. This makes sense. If you think about it, if you think about it, um, let's take the example that I did before. If I right click here and do instance asteroid, I think you would agree that I can only adjust the position of this asteroid now that it's inside of the tree, right? Now that I've added the asteroid, I can move it around and change its position. As you can see right here, the position is changed. Otherwise, I cannot do it because the node is not here. So that's exactly what we're doing here. Here we are adding the whoops, adding the instance to the tree. And here we are. Ah, I cannot type. Here we are. What? Here we are changing the position once once the node is in the tree. Alright. 
So we are going to spawn with that. With what we just created, we are going to spawn how many asteroids we want inside of this function. So this is cool. Um, we just need a, we just need a, one last thing, and it's to set the direction of the asteroid. So to set the direction of the asteroid, um, let's go back to what we are doing here. The function that we just created is going to select one of the position and it's going to place the asteroid somewhere here. So this is fine. But how do you know in which direction the asteroid should go? Really, it's, it, it can be quite complicated to know where the, action, the, the direction should be. So what I'm thinking... <coughs> personally, what I'm thinking is we know that we want the asteroid to go roughly towards the center of the screen. We don't want every asteroid to go towards the center, but we want them to pass somewhere interesting, right? So what we can do is we can compute the direction um, from our position to the center of the screen, and then we can use that direction and rotate it slightly to make sure that not every asteroid will go at the center, okay? That way they will cross the screen and they will cross the screen with different angles. If you think of another way of doing it, you can try. There are many ways of doing that, but I think this is an easy way. So to do that, um, right here, just before we add the child, we are going to compute the direction. <laughs> compute the direction, the asteroid will take okay so to do that we can use the random position that we just calculated this is the position um this is the position of the asteroid and we can use the the position of the screen the um, the center of the screen sorry so we can actually get get viewport wrecked um a get viewport wrecked is going to give us a wrecked too. And so then we can use size, I think, to have the size of the viewport. So basically this is returning the size of what we can see here. In this case, it's going to return 1920 by 1080. And we can use that as the center. This is the center. Um, this can be used as the center of the screen, right? So if we do var center... Whoops. And we divide that by 2. So by doing that, we have the center. Okay? This is the this is the screen size and the center is the screen size divided by 2. So now we can compute the direction. So var direction is going to be the center which is a position 2D minus our random position. We can actually tell Godot that this is a vector 2 if we want. We can actually do it here also. Vector 2. That way it's easier for us to understand what we are doing. And this is also a vector 2. Um, actually, we want to do the opposite. We want to do random position minus... Let me think. Um, we have the center. Yeah, I think we want to do random position minus the center to have the random position minus the center to have the uh, vector pointing in the right direction. If I'm making a mistake, it can be in the other direction. It's not a problem. Okay, and what we can do is we can wrap that into a normalized vector. Because we don't really care about the length of the vector. We only care about in which direction the vector should be pointing, right? So now we can use this direction. And we can say instance dot direction is equal to direction. And the asteroid will be able to use that. So to make a test, we can do spawn asteroid in the ready function. And we can say, okay, let's spawn five asteroids. And let's see what it's doing. 
So let's launch the game. And maybe we made mistakes. It's possible that we go in the opposite direction. Yes, you can see that. So how can I see that? As you can see, my my vector calculation was the opposite. So you can see the the uh, the asteroids are all going in the opposite direction. So to to check to check that outside of the camera, what you can use inside here, if you click on that, you override the camera. And so when you override the camera, so this is the normal camera. And if I override the camera, I can use the viewport to look at wherever I want. If I zoom in the viewport, it's going to zoom in the game. And if I move it, it's going to move it in the game. So I cannot show you both at the same time because my game is, is here. But you can try it on your own. When your game is launched, if you click on this, you can override the camera. And that way you can look around and see what's going on. So in here, that was the mistake. We want to do center minus the random position. And now if we launch, we can see all of the asteroids and they're coming towards the center at full speed and they're colliding with the player. That's why they're not moving anymore. Okay, pretty cool. So take a moment to breathe. It's been two hours. It's, it's way longer than I thought it would be, but explaining everything is, is hard and it takes time. So from now on, we'll go a bit faster um, because I think we've put all of the, all of the important things. We, I've explained all of the important things and now we'll go a bit faster to actually make it playable. What we'll do right, right now is going to reuse what we've seen Previously, so instancing new scenes, creating new scenes, etc. So to make it more interesting, the first thing that I want to do is the asteroids, I think you would agree, should have random size, um, slightly random direction, and also random speeds, right? So we can do that. Let's close that. Let's go into the asteroids and... The first thing that we want to do is go into... Oh, before that, something really important. Um, we've used, right here, we've used a random function. So if you if you want to learn more about random functions, go watch my random function, uh, my video about random. It's really important. But basically the idea is that you have to call randomize at some point in your game, usually at the beginning of your game. So I'm going to call it here inside the game script, inside the game scene, I'm calling randomize. This is to make sure that the random values that you get are truly random. Truly random. In, in reality, it's not real random, but it doesn't matter. It's just to make sure that it's giving you actual random values. So let's go back into the asteroids. And one thing that we can do is we can change the speed. So in here, let's say um, let's say that we want to multiply the speed and we can add, so we can add rend range, we can add to the speed, we can add minus 50 to 50. So basically this will give us a random value between, between minus 50 and 50, and we can add that to the speed, to the base speed. Also, the base speed is quite high. I think we should go with 125. I think it should be better. So this will make sure that they have random speed. Okay. Another thing that we can do is change. Um, another thing that we can do is change the, the size. Because right now, the size is always the same. So we can have in here a random size. So actually, let's do var rend rend size and let's let's get a random value so rend f it's going to give us a random float so a random float value between 0 and 1 and then we can use this rend size um rend size factor 
I'm going to call this, because it's a factor. And then I'm going to use that to scale both the collision shape and the sprite. So how can we do that? Well, the easiest one to do is sprite. We can do dollar sign, sprite, okay? We call sprite to get the node sprite. And one thing that we can change under the node is under transform, we can change the scale. Right now it's one, so we can say scale. <coughs> and we can use directly the rent size factor. Okay. Um, in reality, it's not going to work like that because this is a vector 2 and this is a float. So we can do multiply. Um, we can multiply the scale by the random factor. Uh, multiply equal is the same thing as doing is the same thing as doing um, that, right? Scale times rent size factor, but we can do it faster using multiply equal. So this is going to be between zero and one. So this is going to s make the scale smaller. And actually between zero and one is maybe not a good idea. I don't know why I did that now that I think about it, because if we go to zero, it's going to be zero. We are not going to see anything. So actually let's use rend range. And let's say that the minimum that we want to go is 0 0.2, maybe. And the maximum that we want to go is 1. So we want to go from 0 0.2 to 1. Okay. So we did that with the scale. And now we, do, we need to do that with the collision shape also. So collision shape, we can actually change the radius, the circle radius. So to do that, we can do dollar signs, collision shape. Then we want to grab the property shape, so shape, okay? And then we want to access the radius. It's, it's, it's shown here, property, radius. Radius times equal, we can do the same thing. We can multiply it by the rent size factor, okay? And with that, we are going to have random, a random size. But there is a problem with that, and I want to show you what is the problem. Um, so under debug, you should check visible collision shape, okay? And launch the game. It's going to show you all of the collision shapes. So this is very useful to debug. And you're going to see something. First of all, it's showing you... It's showing you that we can't see the collision shapes on the asteroids. So let's go back to 2D and let's take the collision shape and put it on top of the sprite. That way we're going to be able to see it. Okay, L launch the game again. And what you can see right now is that all of the collision shapes are the same. They are all super small. So why is that? Well, by default, this is something that a lot of beginners, um, this is a mistake that a lot of beginners will make. By default, when, even, when you create a shape, so when you create a resource, it is shared. So, in here, in the asteroid scene, we created a collision shape, right? And basically, every time you create a new asteroid, it's using the same shape. So if you, if you change one shape, it's affecting all of the other shapes. So to do that, to change that, to change that behavior, under the shape, under resource, we can click local to scene. If you, if you stay on it, it's telling you that if true, the resource will be made unique in each instance of its local scene. It can thus be modified in a scene instance without imp impacting other instances of the same scene. Okay, so it's exactly what we want. Remember inside the game here, when we are spawning asteroids, we, are ch we, we want to make sure that we are spawning different asteroids if you want. So by clicking local to scene, we're telling Godot, okay, the circle shape that we are creating here should be unique. That way when we change it later, 
when we change it here, it's not changing all of the other scenes. So now if we launch the game again, as you can see, the shapes now are different sizes and they reflect the size of our sprite. Pretty cool. I think this is pretty cool. So if you don't want to see the debug, the, the shapes again, you can go under debug and you can remove visible collision shapes because we don't need to do that right now. Okay. Um, so right now, we have the spawning of the asteroids. We have the player that is able to move. Let me show you where we are. We have the player that is able to move. So the player should be able to rotate, I think, a bit faster. Uh, we need to be able to shoot, right? So let's let's do that. Just after, um, before that, I want to do something really quickly. I want to make sure that the asteroids... <laughs> I want to make sure that the asteroids are not going to be able to collide with each other. Or maybe we let the asteroids collide with each other, I don't know actually. We'll see that. We'll see that later. I think this can be interesting. Actually, we can destroy the asteroids if they collide with each other. That could be interesting. So let's just make one change under the game scene, under the script. Um, here we created a direction, right? Remember? And the direction basically is a vector that is pointing from one of the position to the center of the screen. To make that a bit more interesting, I think what we can do is we can take that vector and we can rotate it. We can rotate it with a random value to make it a bit more interesting. Otherwise, all of the asteroids are going towards the center. So let's do that. Under game. Um, just, before, just before we put the direction inside the instance direction, we can say direction is equal to direction dot rotated. And then we need to put an angle. So the angle that we need to put is in radians, I think. So be careful about that. So we want a rend. First of all, we want degrees to radians, okay? Because we are going to specify a rotation in degrees and we want to use radians. And inside here, I'm going to use rend range. And I want to rotate, I want to rotate this vector Maybe, maybe minus 45 to 45 degrees. Maybe it's going to be too much. We can, we can check that. Maybe it's going to be too much. And let's launch the game again. And let's see how it looks now. So as you can see, now it looks a bit more interesting because some of the asteroids are not coming towards the center. <laughs> okay, pretty cool. So 45 is maybe a bit too much because let's say, for example, that you are here. If if you want to go towards the center and you rotate 45 degrees, maybe you're going to go outside of the screen. I think it's OK, though. You can reduce it if you want a bit, for example, uh, 40. But that way you have a much more interesting pattern. Some of the asteroids will be close to the screen, but not directly impacting you. I think this can be interesting. All right. So now that we have that, I think it's time for us to shoot projectiles. And by shooting projectiles, we will be able to destroy the asteroids. Pretty cool. <laughs> so let's create. Let's create a new, a new scene, a new 2D scene. So the projectiles, this is, this is an interesting... Uh, an interesting point projectiles what do we want them to do we want to instance them they will go straight in a direction just like the asteroids basically we can use the same code as the asteroid and the only thing that they have to do is check with what they collide they don't need super crazy co uh, collision movement so one thing that we can do to change and show you another node that is built inside Godot we can use an area this time so let's change the type to area 2D. 
Let's save the node again. So go up, create a new folder, create projectile or bullet. Let's say bullet. It's going to be shorter. So bullet and let's rename that to bullet.tscn. Um, I renamed the, 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 the root node bullet. And if we go back to the 2D scene, we have again a configuration warning because an area is basically a node on um, an area is basically a node on which you define a shape and Godot will then check inside that shape if there is something. So let's define a collision shape. And the collision shape that I want to use is, I think, a new rectangle shape. All right. I want to make it quite long. Let's say, let's say that for now it's going to be like that. I will use the sprite in just a second. And so if you go on the, if you go on the bullet, on the area 2D, you can check a bunch of things. So first of all, it's monitoring, meaning that it's going to try to detect um, bodies and areas that are entering it. Monitorable, we don't need to be monitorable, so we can remove that. Meaning that um, no other object can detect those bullets. It doesn't really matter because we want the bullets to be able to detect another asteroid. Then we have a bunch of options. Physics overrides, it's not interesting for us. And audio bus, it's not interesting for us. Maybe later on we want to play with the collisions. Uh, but I will show you that maybe later on because this is not really needed for now. But... Um, it's important for you to know that in Godot, you can use multiple layers to make sure that you put certain things inside certain layers and so they don't interact with each other. So for example, you could put the bullet on another layer that will only interact with the asteroids and not with the player. <coughs> and actually, maybe we can do that. So let's do that. That's... It's, it's a bit more advanced, but I think it's very useful, so let's do it. So under collision, under the area, we will check layer 2 and mask 2, and we will remove the first one. So right now, we have nothing on layer 2, so this will not be able to detect anything. So before doing anything else, let's go back to the asteroid, and under the root node, under collision, you can see that right now we have layer 1 and mask 1, so this is good because... This is to be able to um, detect the player. But we also want to be able to detect the bullets. So let's place layer 2. So the layer is where the object lives. So the object lives in layer 2. And as you can see, we don't check the mask for layer 2. Because the mask is where the, the, um, the object is looking. So in this case, the asteroid doesn't need to look at the layer 2 simply because we want the bullets to look if they collide with something, okay? If you're not familiar with uh, collision layers, if it's a bit confused for you, try to play around with them. Make a bunch of um, objects, change the layers, the mask, and take the time to understand that. It's super important. Um, but I think it will be more clear with the bullets in just a second. So, as you can see, our bullets are living on layer 2, and they're also looking for collisions on layer 2. So, I think right now is the good time to uh, take the sprite. So, open up your favorite window manager again, and under bullets, we can create a new visuals. And... I will use a missile.png. So it's called missile. Uh, oops, I forgot to copy. It's called missile. It's not really a missile, but anyway. <laughs> missile.png. Okay, let's go. Let's go faster because <laughs> we are already at 2 hours and 18 minutes. I hope you're following all right. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. Hesitate. And if you're watching that later on um, as a replay on YouTube, don't hesitate to ask your questions 
in the comment section, of course. So let's use a sprite. And under bullet visuals, let's use missile.png under the sprite. So one thing that we can do really quickly, let's go back to the player. And here we want to instance a child node and we want to instance a bullet. So I'm instancing a bullet right now just to see, just to have a comparison of the size, right? So I can go back to my bullet and I can say, okay, my bullet is really too big. So by holding shift and alt, I can scale it from the center. And if I go back on the player, I can see the size. It's a bit too big. Okay. So I'm at 0.15. 7 so maybe 0 0.15 if i go back on the player 0 0.15 it's fine okay so let's remove the bullet from the player right now we don't need it and let's adjust the collision shape to match the shape okay so the bullet the only thing that the bullet has to do is check if it's colliding with something and then trying to kill this thing so let's go onto the bullet and let's attach a script as always, we click on the little directory, scripts, bullet.gd, create. You start to get used to it because it's always the same thing. Uh, when you're creating a game, you're doing lots of the same things again and again, because most of the basic things that you have to do is very similar. So now we introduce a new things, and it's called the signals. So basically, some nodes um, have... A way of communicating which is a signal so if you go if you click on the bullet and you go under node you can see that it has a bunch of signals so basically the object is going to emit this signal whenever something happens in this case it can emit a signal when a body is entering the area so you have a bunch of signals area entered um, body entered etc what we are interested in is body entered so let's double click on it it's telling you okay you want to connect this signal to something where do you want to connect it so we want to connect it to the script that is on the bullet that we just created and it's going to cr to connect it to the method on bullet body entered and it's going to create it for us okay so let's let's say okay connect and now something happened. It created a function on bullet body entered. And you can see this little icon here. This icon is showing you that this function is connected to a signal. Okay. So the good thing about signals is that whenever, whenever Godot, Godot is doing all of the calculations behind the scenes. And whenever Godot is, um, seeing that a body is entering this area that we just defined it's going to call this function with the body that it's colliding with okay so you know that it's connected with three things first of all the icon that i just show you that i just showed you in the fun in the in the function the icon here is showing you that it's connected under the signals you can see the same icon and it's telling you where it's connected. And as you can see, it's the same name on bullet body entered. It's the same name as here. And you can also see here that now we have a new icon. This new icon is telling us that this is using a signal and that the signal is connected somewhere. So all of those things are telling you that the signal is connected. Okay. Of course, I connected the signal using the editor, but you can also do it through code and maybe we will do it in the future. I'm not sure. We'll see where we, where we go later on. Okay, <clears throat> so what do we want to do? Well, when we have a bullet, when we have a body entering our area, we want to do something. In this case, because we want to, to things to be really simple, I think we are going to destroy the asteroids. We are simply going to destroy it, okay? But you could imagine 
a more complex asteroid that would shrink in size before being destroyed? So let's do something. Let's do body. So body is passed by the function and it represents the body with which you're colliding, right? So body, and we can, um, add, we can use the function take damage and we are going to say how much damage we want to take. We want to send, sorry. Um, so right now we don't use any damage. So let's say damage, it's an int. Let's create a new, a new variable. It's an int. But we are not going to use that, okay? This is something that you can do in the future if you want. After this tutorial, you can go and implement the damage system. So we are going to call take damage. But take damage doesn't exist. If we go back to the asteroid, if we go back to the script on the asteroid, we don't have any function for that. So actually, let's create one. Let's create in func, take damage. Um... So we are going to receive the amount of damage that we want to receive as an int and we want to return nothing. So in this case, I think what I want to do is I want to create another function that is called destroy. And this function destroy, you can do a bunch of things, but in this case, I will just remove the scene entirely from the game. Inside of Godot, there's a very simple way to remove a node from your game. And it's to call Q3. So Q3 is a function that is telling Godot, okay, I want this node to be removed. Remove it whenever you can. That's why you have a Q in front of it, okay? You can call the function free directly, but it's a bit unsafe because sometimes Godot is doing calculations with your node, especially, for example, with physics. Um... Godot can be doing calculations with your node. So if you call free at that moment, it will remove the node. And then it will cause problem with the calculations that we're doing, that it was doing. So by being safe, you call Q3. And it's telling Godot, okay, make sure that you remove this node as soon as you can. In Quake, there is global take damage that can, that takes arguments for the herter and herty, plus some parameters about the damage type. Mm. Yes, yes. Um, in, in Godot, there are many ways of doing it. And if you know that you're going to have a lot of objects that can receive damage, maybe it's interesting to either create an object from which they inherit with the same behavior, or a child object with that. In this case, we only have the asteroids, and it's the only object that can take damage. Um, but yes, you're right. If in Quake, for example, you have multiple enemies, you have different weapons, so you want a system that is more interesting and that can be a bit more flexible. So in, in my case, for example, I don't want to take that into account, so I will... I will um, I will do that. Uh, I will write something. Exercise for the viewer. Implement health for the asteroids. And um, and ensure and remove health when taking damage when health reaches zero you destroy the asteroids to go even further you can scale the sprite and collision of the asteroids asteroid each time to show that the asteroid is taking damage okay but this is not something that i want to do right now we don't have time so in my case i will just call destroy destroy the asteroid all right and in and in destroy we simply remove the asteroid so now we have the bullet 
um, and we need the bullet to move. So one thing that we can do is <coughs> reuse basically the same code as we did in the asteroid. So let's go on the asteroid code. Let's copy all of that. Let's go back to the bullet code. So as you can see, I, I didn't show you that, but when you're editing scripts, you also have the scripts available here if you want to go from one script to another. So let's go back to the bullet script and remove the ready function with that. Okay, so we also have a speed, we also have a velocity, and we also have a direction, right? We don't want to change the sprite scale and the collision shape scale, and we don't have move and collide. That is the only difference. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, the rent size factor, we don't have that. And the speed, we don't want to change the speed because the speed should be fixed. So the speed of the... I think the speed of the... of the thing should be quite fast. At least 300. <coughs> <coughs> and the direction will be set by the player when we instance the bullet. So to make our bullet move, um, we can't use move and collide because it's not a kinematic body. So what we can do is we can simply move the position itself. So if you go under the inspector, under transform, under position, you can see that you have the position of the player. So the position is the, pos the position relative to the player and the global position is the, is the position relative to the world, to the entire world. So you can use both in this case, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to use global position. And I'm going to add, basically plus equal, I'm going to add every frame. I'm going to add the velocity. And I don't forget to multiply by delta. Because remember, when you're doing something every frame, you want to make sure that you're multiplying by delta um, to not have a different input based on the speed of your uh, computer okay so the the bullet should do that there's also one thing that the bullet should do when the bullet has done damage the bullet should die so let's do q3 basically you will remove the bullet when whenever you hit something okay we have something so let's go back to the player now and let's use that so remember, you know how to you know how to um, grab the reference to a scene. You do export var bullet scene. It's a packed packed scene. And remember, if we go under bullet .tscn, we can drag it to here and press Control. Oops, and I forgot the equal equal preload, and it's going to preload the bullet. Okay. Perfect. So let's do a few things. Under the process function, we are going to check if we are pressing the shoot uh, action. So if input dot is action just pressed, and we can use shoot this time, we can call a function that is shoot. So let's create that function, shoot. Um, so remember, we can use the same code as we did before, but I'm going to re I'm going to re uh, rewrite it for you here. That way, you can really sh really see how we instance a scene. So we do var instance. You can call it whatever you want. Of course, it's just a temporary name that we need a temporary variable that we need. So I want to use bullet scene. I want to instance it. Okay, now I have the instance. And I want to set a few things. I want to set the position. And I also want to set the direction. And then I want to add it to the tree. So one thing that is important here, we don't want to add the we don't want to add the bullet as a child of ourselves. I think you would agree with that. Because our player is moving, if we add the bullet as a child, I, actually I can show you. So let's imagine that we do add child, right? 
we would have the bullet right here. But the problem is, our player is moving. So if our player is moving, you can see that everything is moving with it. And so the bullet would also move. So what we need to do is we need to add the child um, somewhere higher in the hierarchy. If, you, if we look at the game, you know that the player is here. So we can add the bullet to the game, basically. So to do that, to do that, what we can do, because we know that the parent of the player is the game, we can do get parent dot add child, and we can add the instance. So basically, what this is doing, if you go back to the game, the player is creating a bullet, and it's grabbing the parent. So the parent is game, and it's telling game, "Hey, can you add a child, please?" And so the child will be added here. So the bullet will be here. Okay? And as you can see, if you move the player now, the bullet is independent because it's not a child of the player. Okay? And of course, if you place the bullet as a child of the player, now it's moving with it. Alright. So in Godot, the relationship between the nodes is super important. Um, every child will basically inherit everything that the parent is doing. This is super useful because you only need to move one node and everything is moving with it. But of course, it can make some pretty weird things if you don't want that. So to set the position and the direction, I want to define two positions. To be precise, I will add a child, I will add a position 2D, and I will do the same thing as we did with the um, spawn position. So place the spawn, place the position here, and place it here. Let's place it here. So let's call it bullet position left. Let's duplicate that node, control D to duplicate. Let's rename it to bullet position right. And actually under the transform, what we can do to place it exactly at the opposite side, we can simply go from minus 17 to 17. All right. And now we have two shooting positions. That way we can that way you can change that later on if you if you want to because we are going to use the positions of those nodes to instance our bullets. So if you want, later on, maybe you change the design, maybe you change the design of the player, and you only want to shoot from the center, so you can put the position from here, right? So let's do that. And so when we shoot, actually, what I want to do is I want to instance two things. I want to instance two bullets because I want to shoot two bullets at a time. This is this is how I'm, uh, this is how I'm doing it. Um, this is really a, a question of game design. So if you want to do differently, do differently. In this case, I want to do two instances. So I will Control D to duplicate, and I will call instance two, and I will do the same thing here. Um, and then I will set the position. So to set the position, I can say instance, oops, instance dot um, global position is equal to bullet position left global position. I can duplicate this. Instead of left, I use right. And I can use instance two, right? And then we can do the same thing. We can do instance two, instance, sorry, dot direction and we can get a direction so just as we did before just as we did before with the global transform of the player remember to know in which direction to go no matter the rotation of the player we use global transform dot x we can actually use that but with bullet position so bullet position left dot global transform dot x, you duplicate that, you replace left with right, and you do instance two. 
So set the position. Uh, we want to set the position only after we are in the tree. So let's do it here. Instance the position. So the direction will be the direction will be the x vector of this bullet position and thus it will change depending on your rotation okay just as we did before so when we shoot it's instancing that and it's doing its thing and inside the bullet you can see that at the beginning we define the velocity depending on the direction and the speed and then every frame we move okay so i think now if we launch the game We should have a way to shoot. Okay. And as you can see, when it's colliding with an asteroid, it's removing the asteroids. Pretty cool. There's only one problem. And it's and it's that the <coughs> there's only one problem, and it's that the bullets are not um, in the right orientation, right? So, we can change that quite easily, actually, at the beginning of the script. Remember, I told you that by default, for Godot, this is zero rotation, okay? So what we can do is we can get the angle of the direction that we are using. So let's say that we want to go in this direction, in this vector here. Um, we can use the angle... And we can use the angle to change the angle of our bullet like that. So for example, here, th that would be minus 68. So let's do this. In here, we have the direction. So we can do rotation. This is the rotation of the area. And we can say that it's equal to the direction dot angle. So the angle is a function um, that is built in Godot on vector 2. And basically, it's giving you the angle of the vector 2 between 0, okay? This is 0. This is 0 in x. And if your vector is somewhere here, the angle that you have between here and here is going to be given by this function. So by plugging, in that, in, by plugging that into rotation, we rotate... We rotate our bullet to be in the same angle as the direction. Um, of course, this is in radians. So that's why I'm plugging it inside rotation. So let's try it again. Let's launch. And now when we shoot, we are shooting in the right orientation. Okay, pretty cool. So, as you can see... Um, there's something quite funny and it's that our player is going faster than the, the, the bullets <laughs> so when you spawn a bullet you can outrun it so I think one easy way to fix that is to make the bullet much faster maybe make them 900 yes and now it looks like you're shooting bullets Okay, pretty cool. Um, so just to change a few things, I think the rotation speed of the player is still too slow. So 200 might be good. And maybe let's reduce a bit the speed. Let's try again. Yeah, now it's, it's rotating much faster. This is better. All right. And with that... With that, you basically have a game. So, if you want to stop here, it's fine. Because you've seen how to create a player and how to make it move. You've seen how to create multiple scenes. So, for example, one for the player, one for the game, one for the asteroid. You've seen how to instance new objects. So, how to spawn new objects. And you've seen uh, how to do... Sorry, you've seen how to do interactions between those objects. So how do you detect that you're colliding with something? For example, using an area. Um, what I f think I will do right now really quickly is I will go a bit further. 
So, because, of course, it doesn't look super good, what we are doing. I will go a bit further, but I will try to go a bit faster to go further, okay? So, if you want to stop here or do things on your own, it's totally fine. I will try to um, add a bit more things to the game to make it more interesting, okay? So, first things first, I want to go back to the... I want to go back to the folders, to the visuals folder, and I want to go into the game, okay? So scripts, no, I want to create a new folder called visuals. All right, and in visuals, I will place two things. I will place the backgrounds and the star. That way we can make the whole thing a bit more interesting. So if you go under the game, Right now, the background that we have doesn't look super good. So one easy way to do things would be to add a sprite. And under the sprite, we would add the background texture. Okay, so of course, you have to place the sprite roughly in the middle. And you have to place it beneath the player. Otherwise, the player will not be shown. Okay, so you have that. Why not? It's not incredible, but it's it works. I can rename it to background. And to make things a bit more interesting, I can add some particles. So I can go on here, click add child node, particles 2D. Again, I move the particles to be behind the player and just on top of the background. Right now, I don't have anything under the particles, but I can already do something. Is under process material, I will create a new material. So click here, new particles material. And under the new particles material, we have a bunch of options, but we'll go back to that in just a second. If you zoom in now, you can actually see the particles. It's just that, it's just that they are very, very small. So one thing that we can do is under texture right here, we can use the new textures that we just added. So game, visual, star. We can use start on PNG and use it under the texture. And now you can see that we're using the stars. Okay, pretty cool. So I'm gonna go I'm gonna do a few things here. First of all, I want to change the lifetime. I want the particles to be here for a very long time because they are going to simulate stars. I also want more stars. I want at least 40 stars, I think. Maybe even more than that. We'll see. Now, if I go under the process material, there are a bunch of options. I'm not going to show you everything. I'm just going to show you a few things. So emission shape. First of all, right now, everything is emitting from one point. So what I want is to change that to box. <laughs> and I can change the extents. So I know that my screen is 1920 by 1080. So I can use that. So if I do 1920, as you can see right now, it's emitting on a much larger scale. But you also you, you also have to understand that extents um, doesn't represent the full length. Extents is just half of the length. So it's going to use 1920 two times, okay? So you can actually use that divided by 2. And you can do 1080 divided by 2. And now it's going to spawn in roughly the same size as the screen. If you want, you can make that a bit bigger. For example, 1200 and 700. Just to make sure that you cover the whole screen. Um, right now it's difficult to see where they're spawning from. So what you can do is under particles, you click on it and you click generate visibility rect. You check for 11 seconds. Okay. Then it's going to let the particles run for a bit. And it's going to show you. Right. It's going to show you the rectangle on which um, the particles are showing. So in our case, the, part, the, the rectangle is very big in the bottom because the particles are going to the bottom. But in just a second, I'm going to change that. 
So take the particles and place them roughly over roughly over your screens like that. Okay, perfect. Let's go back to the particles material. So emission shape, it's okay, we did that. Flags, we don't care about that. Direction, we don't really care about that for now. It's gravity that we want to change. So right now there's a bit of gravity on the <coughs> on the particles and that's why they're moving. So let's remove the gravity. Now you can see it looks more like um like stars. But we can change a few things to make it more interesting. First of all, we can add a bit of angular velocity. So maybe we can make the the we can make the the stars rotate a bit. But you want them to rotate slowly to not be too distracting, right? So let's say let's say 5 is okay. And you can add a bit of randomness to that to make sure that they don't all rotate at the same spell at the same time. Also, right now, it doesn't look super good because they are way too big and they spawn very abruptly, right? So we can change that. First of all, let's go under the angle. And what you can do is you can put the angle to the maximum and the angle random to the maximum. That way the starting angle will be completely random. Then what you want to go you want to go under scale. And under scale we can reduce the base scale of the stars. So I think if you compare the scale, if you compare the stars to the object, I think we can use maybe 0. 0. 0.2 compared to the player. And we can use a bit of randomness. So the randomness is going to add to the to the scale. So be careful to not if you use if you use a value that is too big like that, then you're going to add that randomness to the basic scale. So it's going to be way too big. So I think we can even go with something smaller like 0.1 and add 0.25 as randomness. And now it looks better. Okay. Um, the last thing that I want to change is the color right now. Because, because the color is not changing, the particle is like showing and then it's going off. So under color, under color ramp, we can define a gradient of the color that they should go to over time. So basically, you go under color ramp, you click new gradient texture, you click on it, and gradient, you click new gradient. Okay. Now when you click on gradient, you see you have two things that you can move around. You can actually click somewhere to create a new one and you can left click, right click, sorry, to remove a value. So if you click on the first value right there, you can see the color that it's at. And what I want to do is I want to change that to full white. OK. Actually, I'm going to create another one right there, right there. That way we have white and white. And if I go on the first one again, I can click and I can remove the alpha. I can make that completely zero. And as you can see right now, when the stars are popping, they are fading in. Basically what I created here is a fade in, right? So you can adjust the amount of time that it's going to take. You can see the gradient here as the colors that they will take over time. So when they spawn first, they will take that color. And then over the lifetime, they will go over the gradients here. So basically, we can do the same thing here. We can move this bar right there. Click to create a new one. Put it at the very end. Click again to change the color. And make it transparent again. So as you can see right now, we have something much cooler. We have actually some stars that are popping in and out and if you want that to be less visible because right now it's very visible maybe what you can see is change the lifetime to something much bigger like a hundred that way the that way the uh, the particles will be alive for much longer than 10 seconds and then you can adjust your gradient however you feel like okay um, also, the amount is maybe too small, so you can play with that. For example, 75. Give it a bit of time because the lifetime is very long, so it will take a lot of time for the gradient to go under um, something visible, right?
And with that, we have a background that is much more interesting, I think. Um, so if we play the game, this is how it looks like. So at the beginning, there's nothing. But then you can see the stars that are popping in. I think this is pretty cool. You can move around. You can shoot. Okay. So, something that I would like to change right now is the fact that the there are, there are a few problems, actually. First of all, you don't see it, but when I shoot... So let me, sh let me show you real quick. So if I shoot, and if we take a look at the game right now, actually you're not going to be able to see it, so you have to trust me because I can't go fast enough. But basically the, uh, the bullets, they will go on forever if they don't shoot anything, if they don't touch anything. And this is not great because every time we're adding bullets, we're adding a new object to the scene. And so at some point you could have thousands of objects so we want to remove the objects when they are outside of the screen right there is an easy way to do that with Godot. so under the bullet click add child node and you can add a visibility notifier so click on that and then you have this rectangle that you can adjust so make it the size of your of your bullet roughly and basically this is this will act a bit similarly as an area, it will tell you when you are exiting the viewport. So for example, viewport exited. We can click on this signal, connect it to the bullet again. And we can queue free at that time, alright? So basically, when we have the signal that we are outside of the screen, we can remove the, the bullet. This is better. Um, we can actually do the same thing with the asteroid because the same thing will happen with the asteroids so visibility notifier again make that roughly the size of your of your asteroid under the node viewport exited connect and now you can um, destroy. So there might be a problem with this uh, function right now because we never entered. Let, let's check. Let's check if it's a problem or not because the the asteroids are spawned outside of the screen. No, it's okay actually. I thought that maybe because the asteroids were spawned outside they would be directly removed, but that's not the case. We can actually print in here to know when they are destroyed. Destroyed. So print will... What am I doing? Print will actually output inside the, 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 the terminal here. So as you can see, if we're not doing anything, When this one is going to go outside of the screen, it's get destroyed. Same thing for this one. You will see destroyed. Okay. And then this one is destroyed. And this one is destroyed. Okay. Pretty cool. Um, to make things a bit more interesting again, we can make it so that when the, um, when the asteroids are colliding they change direction i think this can be more interesting so under the physics process right now you have move and collide and if you right click if you hold control and click on it you can see that move and collide is actually um, giving you a kinematic body collision kinematic collision 2d and this thing has a bunch of information on the collision that just happened okay so we can actually grab the collision so var Collision is equal to move and collide. And now we have the information of the collision in here. So the first thing that we can do is if there's no collision, we do nothing. So if not collision, 
we return. So collision will be null. Collision will be null if you have no collision. So by doing by doing this check, we check if there's something inside the collision basically. And if there's nothing, we can return. Basically, it means that we go, we we s s uh, stop the function. We go out of the function. So here we have a collision. So what we want to know is what kind what kind of collision is it? Is it with the player or is it with the asteroid? And I can show you a cool way to make gr to make uh, nodes inside different groups. So if you click on asteroids under the node tab, you have the signals, but you also have the groups. If you go under the groups, you can actually create some groups and all of the asteroids will be inside that groups. So I can say asteroids. Okay. And now my asteroid is inside the group asteroids. So every time I'm spawning a new asteroid, it's inside that group. And I can ask Godot to know if a node is inside a group or not. So I can do the same thing, go on player and under node, I can type player to create a new group, okay? So now under the asteroid, I can do something simple. I can say if um, the collision dot collider, so the collider is the object that we are colliding with, I can ask is is in ah is in group if it's in the group asteroids i know it's an asteroid right so what i can do is i can bounce so we can bounce off the asteroids using the collision normal so how do we do that well, in Godot, there's a built-in function to do that. So we can change the velocity by doing velocity is equal to velocity dot bounce. And we need to provide a normal. So the collision normal is basically a vector that is showing you when there's a collision between two objects like that. Boom. It's showing you. It's giving you the vector that is showing you in which direction the collision is happening. And so you can use that collision dot normal to pl to pay to place it inside the bounce function and the bounce function is simply going to take the the input vector and it's going to bounce it um compared to the normal right so if you go under the bounce it's telling you what it's doing and actually if you go under the do the godot documentation the Godot documentation has a now nice, um, has a nice, I will try to show you really quickly. Um, oh no, I thought they had, I thought they had, but actually they don't. Well. I'm, if you if you type on on Google, I think you can find the example where it's showing you um, what it's doing. But basically, you you can use bounce to um, represent what a very simple collision would do. Like if you if you have a plane like this, you have a ball coming towards that plane like that. It's going to basically bounce at the opposite direction um, with the same force if the collision is perfect. And this is exactly what we're doing here, right? So we're going to bounce off the collision. Let's take an example. Let's launch the project and let's see what it's doing. So hopefully we will have a collision. Maybe here we will have a collision. Up and it's bouncing. Okay, pretty cool. So now, as you can see, um, it's bouncing only its velocity and the other object is not bouncing. So what we can do, because the other object is not detecting the collision, it depends on the order of collisions, right? Um, we can we can actually tell the other object to uh, to bounce if we want. So for that, we can do collision dot collider dot velocity, and we can use the same thing velocity. 
and we can use the collider dot velocity but instead of using the collision normal we will use the minus collision normal this is important because the collision normal is with respect to our object and so we want to also see it from the other and oh What is the problem? Invalid set index collider on base kinematic body with value of type. Sorry, what? Collision dot collider. Invalid set index collider on base. Oh, we cannot do that because the reference is not here. Okay, so let's grab the reference var collider. Let's put the reference in here. And I think we might be able to do it now using collider. I hope we will have a collision again. Because we were very lucky to have collisions in the past. Here we'll have a collision, I think. <laughs> and now they bounce off, both of them. And I can kill them. Okay, pretty cool. So now one last thing that we need to do to make sure that the game will actually... Um, um, will actually spawn enough asteroids is we can make sure to spawn a new asteroid every time a previous asteroid is being destroyed. So how can we do that? Well, when we spawn the asteroid, we can connect a signal from this asteroid to the game to know if the asteroid is being destroyed or not. So in our asteroid right now, we don't have any signal. If you go here, we don't have any signal telling that we are dead, right? Actually, we could use the tree exited. It means that we are not in the tree. But what I can do is create myself a new signal. I think this is a good thing to learn. So at the very top here, under the asteroid script, I will use signal destroyed with parenthesis. And now I can, as you can see, now under the signals, we can see this new signal that I just created, which is pretty cool. We can define our own signals. And now when I'm destroyed, so just before being destroyed, I can call... Oops. What happened? I can't scroll anymore. I... <laughs> I... I pressed scroll lock on my computer. So I can call emit signal. And I can emit the new signal I just created. So emit signal destroyed. Okay, pretty cool. So now inside the game, when I... When I create the instance of the asteroid, what I can do is I can say connect the destroyed signal. So I can say instance dot connect. I want to connect what? I want to connect destroyed. I want to connect it to myself. Okay, so self is the game scene and I want to connect it to the method or the function on um, on asteroid destroyed destroyed okay and I will create this function so let's create it here all right and void so right now as, as you can see we are not passing any information but if you want you can create a signal in which you pass information for example you could pass self and in here you could say okay um, i'm passing myself that way you know which asteroid is being destroyed but we don't need that here so let's control z that better asteroid collision than nova drift already <laughs> i don't know nova drift but <laughs> but this is this is funny um okay so on asteroid destroyed what we want to do we know that one asteroid has been destroyed. 
so we can call the function spawn asteroid and we can spawn one asteroid okay so now let's let's check that let's launch the game let's kill a bunch of asteroids all right and as you can see we have more asteroids coming pretty cool We actually have a lot of asteroids. So one easy way to, to kill everything is to rotate around yourself and do that. But it's not super funny. Also, you can use your gamepad. I, I forgot to use the gamepad, but you can use the gamepad. Um, to move around, it's actually better. And then you can shoot. Alright. So it's a pretty simple game. Um... It's a pretty simple game. As you can see, we don't have a death state. Um, we don't have a win state. We don't have score. We don't have lots of particles. There are so many things we can do. But we've we've already been um, doing that for three hours. So I think I will have to stop now. Because I want this tutorial to be kind of usable. Um, so I think the last thing that I will do is... I will... Um, I will handle the fact that the player is being touched by an asteroid. And if it's the case, we are simply restarting the game, okay? That way it's an easy way to, to, to die. And if you're interested, I can make a similar live stream, let's say next week or I don't know when, where we take this project and we push it further by implementing score, by implementing... A better movement because right now the movement as you can see the movement is really really the movement is really stiff like you go you you start at full speed right away it doesn't look super good it doesn't look very spacey right also it's lacking some um some particles maybe for the shooting for the explosions for stuff like that basically we can take the game further if you're interested that would be a more advanced tutorial. It would be more for like uh, not complete beginners. And I would not go into all of the details I went in this tutorial. So if this is something that is interesting for you, please tell me in the comments and I will make sure to uh, plan something like that. So to finish, let's do that. Let's go under the player script. And under the player script, we can do the same thing as we did with the asteroid, right? We can say var collision is equal to move and collide. From here, you know the drill. We've done that just before. So if not collision, we return. It means we don't have to do anything. Actually, I can write it here. There's no collision. We can return. Okay. So if there's a collision, we need to check if it's an asteroid or not. So if collision.collider dot is in group asteroids, if it's in asteroids, oops, it means that we need to take damage. So take damage or die instantly, it's up to you. And so here I will have a function called destroy. And I will create it right now because right now we don't have a function called destroy. So func destroy. It's returning nothing. And in this function, I will not I will not call q3. Okay? Because if I call q3, then it's just removing the player. So here we have two choices. Either we send a signal to the parent or we handle things ourselves. So I think the best way is to send a signal to the parent. So basically, at the top of the script, I can send a signal called destroyed. I can call I can just define a signal called destroy. And now I can oops, I can do emit signal destroyed. All right. So if we go under this under the game, we can connect the signal from the player to the game. So we can do it in two ways. Either we can use the interface and under node we can use the destroyed signal that we can see here. Or we can use the same thing that we did here 
and connect the signal using the script. Because the player is already here, I think it's fine to use destroyed like this. So you double click on the signal. You want to connect it on the game, okay? And on player destroyed, okay? And here, basically what I want is to restart the whole game. So there's an easy way to do it with Godot. You can call get tree. So get tree is taking the base scene tree. So when Godot is creating a game, it's creating a tree, okay? And in this tree, it will put your different nodes. So it will put your game scene with the background, the particles, etc. And you can, you can use that and say, okay, I want you to reload the current scene. I want you to reload, in this case, the game scene. So let's check that. <coughs> so let's go and collide with an asteroid. And as you can see, we were destroyed. And so we restart. Pretty cool. Right? Boom. Just like that. And then you can go and kill all of your enemies. I mean, the asteroids. Alright, so I think we will stop here because we have a game that is kind of working. Um... If you have any questions, again, please don't hesitate to ask. I will try my best to reply. You will find the source code of this game on GitHub. And actually, I will do it as I'm speaking um, with you. So I will open up the folder that we just created. You will also find all of the assets on Google Drive. The link is already in the description. Um... All of the assets and the code are under MIT, so you can do whatever you want with it. You can take the assets and uh, modify them if you want. You can also take the project and make it into a full game and release it if you want. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, also, if you're actually making the game and also if you're making changes to the game and stuff and you want to share, please share with us on Discord. The link is in the description right now. You can get to my Discord server and under show your work or whatever, you can um, actually show me and show to the community what you just did. Um, so what I will do is this is VS Code. I'm not going to go into details right there, but uh, basically what I can do is I can initialize a repository. So this is Git basically. Um, I will add a few files to the git ignore. Um, so everything that is under import will be ignored. I will do uh, I will do initial commit from first live. And then I will publish that branch to GitHub uh, in a public repository called Asteroids. And it should be published in a few seconds. And so that way I will be able to um, give you the link. All right, it's already in here. So here's the link. If you want to check out the code, the source code, I will put it in the description. Um, to finish, I will just launch the game and show you what we did. So this is what we did. Um, this is the little game that we created. It supports keyboard, it supports gamepad. Um, if you have any questions, again, don't hesitate to ask. Please try the game. Try to make it. Try to make different things. If you want to go further, I can already give you a few inputs on what you can do. You can try to make the movement a bit smoother by using Lerp. Um, but this is something that I can do in a future life. You can use some particles, especially when the um, asteroids are exploding. You can make an explosion animation for example or with particles you can use maybe you can change the color of the asteroids at the beginning of your in the ready function you can maybe change for a random color um, maybe you can add different movement mechanic to the asteroids um, i'm thinking right now as i'm seeing it that the fact that they bounce off each other is actually not super interesting because they will mostly 
always bounce off each other and they will not go towards you. So this is not amazing. You can also change the way we are shooting. Right now we can shoot uh, as much as we want, as fast as we, as we want. So maybe you can try to implement a shooting mechanic that requires energy or reloading or whatever. And of course you can go further and do whatever you want. Add enemies, add different types of behaviors, add whatever you want. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for... Uh, thanks for being here. If you find this useful, give it a like, give it a subscribe. Uh, don't forget to check out my other content on here on YouTube on this channel. You can also check my other channel if you're interested. Uh, Mr. Elliptic, where I talk about game dev and a bunch of cool stuff. You can also check my game if you want. And in the future, you will be able to check my course for Godot. Well, thanks everyone. And I will see you next time for a next live stream, maybe. Bye.